yeah, thank you. So, so can, can you see my slides now? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, okay, good. So, I mean, by, by the way, I, I talked to Peter Korotev, like, I, I guess, last night for him, and uh, he had some crap. He was going to take a flight today, and it was late. So, I, I think he's still uh, on the flight, but he, he was sorry that he couldn't come to the beginning. Uh, but anyway, the th things I want to talk about is joint with Martin Halnes, Edwin Langman, and uh, Masatoshi Nomi. Um, and I will, okay, now it works. Um, yeah, so the, the topic of the talk is, maybe you could say it's a bit technical, but I will, I will try to give some introduction and explain how it's connected to other things that people might talk about at the workshop. So the, the long title is really higher order elliptic deformed Rosner's operators. And, and I will talk about some things we did with these operators, uh, especially I will mention the proof of the commutativity and something called kernel functions. Uh, and then I want to stress the relations to elliptic hypergeometric functions, because um, that's maybe interesting to some of you. Um, so anyway, let, let's start with the original quantum Calogero model from 1971. Um, so that's, that's given by this Hamiltonian, which um, can be viewed as a system of quantum particles on the line that are interacting with this inverse square potential. Uh, and the main point is that this is integrable in the sense that you can write down other differential operators as many as the number of variables that are independent and all commute. Um, and you can even do this if you replace the inverse square here by the inverse of a sine function, or you could take a hyperbolic function, or in the biggest generality you could take by a Strauss P function. Um, and this can be generalized in different ways. So uh, one way was found by Charlie Feigen and Veselov. And here I write down something more general that was given by Sergeyev. Um, so in this Hamiltonian, there's apparently two types of particles. Some are uh, labeled by X's and some by Y's. Uh, and they all interact by inverse square potentials. Uh, but you see the um, strength of this interaction is a bit different for all the particles. Uh, and you would really have to fine tune these constants in the right way. Uh, then it will still be integrable. Uh, it will still be a part of a family of commuting differential operators. Um, and by tradition, this type of model is called a deformed yeah. model. But probably it's better to think of it as some superversion rather than as a, a deformation. Um, and there's definitely some links to Lee super algebras. Uh, this has appeared in random matrix theory. Uh, there's some connections to fractional quantum Hall effect and so on. So just I mentioned that there, there, there are some reasons that people have been interested in this type of models. Um, and another thing you could do in another direction is um, to look at relativistic generalizations that were introduced by Rosners. Um, and let me introduce some notation that I will use a lot. So I use additive notation and X in bracket, that just means, well, if, if you like Weierstrass, it's a Weierstrass sigma function. If you like Jacob, it's a theta function. Well, if, if you don't like either of these guys, you could think that X in bracket is just X. I mean, that's a perfectly interesting special case. And all, all trigonometric and hyperbolic cases are included. Uh, then the Rosner's operator, uh, so I just write down the first order one here. So it's a difference operator, so it's a sum of translations. Um, so th th this is notation for translating the xi variable uh, by uh, delta, which is a parameter. And you have a, some coefficient that involves some other parameter, kappa. Um, and the reason why this is called relativistic, uh, well, then you, you shouldn't quite view uh, this D I had as a Hamiltonian, uh, but you should add something else. So you, I, I let D hat be D after replacing both these parameters by the negatives. So I mean, you, you um, have something where you shift in the opposite direction and you shift the coefficient accordingly. Um, so if you take that as a Hamiltonian, 
and then you take the difference as a momentum operator and you could write down some boost operator. Uh, then those operators satisfy the Poincaré algebra uh, in, in one space dimension. So in that sense, there's some relativistic invariance. Um, and it's not maybe completely obvious, but you, you can get the Hamiltonian I showed before as a limit of this one, delta tends to zero. And I also want to mention that uh, McDonald polynomials give eigenfunctions uh, of these operators. Um, and it might be helpful to note that the uh, usual parameters of McDonald theory, Q and T, are given by exponentials of delta and kappa. Um, uh, and then you could play both these games. You could deform the Rösner's operators. So that was studied first by Charlik and then by other people. Uh, and in the tri trigonometric case, integrability of this model was proved not that long ago by Feigen and Silantjev. And they used some affine Heck algebras to get that. Um, so what I want to describe in this talk is a more direct approach. So more like a brute force approach. Uh, which has the advantage that it works in the elliptic case. And in the elliptic case, uh, there was no proof before that these models are really integrable. I mean, you could write them down, but uh, uh, it, it wasn't really known that the operators commute and so on. Um, so just, so th this is a summary of the introduction. So I started with this Calogero Hamiltonian, and then I want to generalize this in four different ways at once. So I wanted it to be elliptic, defined by elliptic functions. I, I want this deformed or super things with two types of particles. Then I want it to be rel relativistic. So that should be instead of differential operator, difference operators. And I also want to consider not just one operator, but higher order operator. So I get a commuting family of operators. Um, so that, that's, I mean, why it's a bit technical because I want to do all these four things uh, at once. Uh, but anyway, what, what are those higher order elliptic deformed Rosner's operators? Uh, well, first of all, they, they are um, some difference operators. They, they are linear combinations of translation operators. And you have two types of variables. There's M X variables and R Y variables. Uh, and you act uh, by different types of shifts in these variables. Um, so in the X's I will act by arbitrary integral multiples or, or positive integral multiples of the parameter delta. And in the y variables, I just act by, so the i's here are zero or one. So either I subtract kappa or, or I don't subtract anything. Um, so this, I mean, it, it's maybe it reminds you of, of bosons and fermions. I, I'm not claiming that it's really a model for bosons and fermions, but uh, I mean, the shifts in the x variables, they kind of stack up like bosons but, and but in the y variables, e either you shift or you don't. So uh, that, that's something that looks more like a fermion. Um, so the operators will be some combinations of these translations. Uh, and before I can write them down, I need some more notation. So I mean, this is standard. I, I have these uh, sequences of zeros and one, and I will identify them with sets in the standard way and just I mean, move back and forth between sequences and sets. Uh, and I want some notation for elliptic shifted factorials. So th this is just a product of theta functions or sigma functions uh, where you shift. I, I will always shift here by delta. So I, I don't write delta explicitly. Um, so you, you, I mean, you, you, you shift the variables by some multiples of delta. OK, th then I can write uh, this thing down. Uh, so here's the operators acting on m plus r variables, and it's of degree k. So the total degree of all the shifts is k. And I have these translations I had before, and I have some coefficients. And, and the coefficient is this product, which I, of, of course, I mean, it, it's something that you have to get, to get used to. Uh, but once, I mean, it, it's possible to work with this. Um, so in, in the y variables you have, I, I hope you can see my, uh, point to, by the way. So in the y variables, you have this thing that looks just like the Rosner's thing. In, in the x variable, you have more the, these kind of hypergeometric things with shifted factorials. And then you, have, then you have some cross factors, which are 
quite simple, just uh, some simple combinations of theta functions. Okay, so this uh, operator is what I want to talk about. Um, uh, some sort of special cases. So if, if m is zero, if you just have the second type of particle, uh, then you recover, of course, the Rosner's operators. Except that I have, um, the way I set this up, you have to interchange delta and minus kappa. So before I chose, I showed you this with case one, this is the general higher order Rosner's operators. Um, and in the other case, when R is zero, when you have only like the first type of particles, then these operators are uh, in a paper by Nomi and Sano, and they have this form. Um, so the, this year is actually mis misleading. It, it's quite an old paper, but they just submitted it recently for publication. Um, so the most important thing here is that these operators all commute. Uh, and also if you take the first m plus r of them, so as many as the variables, then they will be algebraically independent, at least for generic values of the parameters. So together, this would, I would say, would prove that the deformed Rosner's model is integrable. Um, and I, I will talk a little bit about how to prove the commutativity, but I will also mention some other things before that. Um, so one is that we still have this relativistic invariance. So you might recall that the Rosner's Hamiltonian is basically this Rosner's operator plus the same operator where you replace delta by minus delta and kappa by minus kappa. Um, so in the deformed case, you do the same thing, but I, I also have to shift the variable somehow, but that's actually inessential. I, I could get rid of this by slightly redefining the operators. Um, so you don't, you don't have to worry about that. Um, but anyway, if you do that, it turns out that these hatted operators commute with the original operators which is not obvious, that that's something you have to prove. Um, and it turns out that if you, if you define basically the Hamiltonian momentum in the same way as before, but using the deformed operators, and then uh, the boost more or less like before, uh, then you get uh, a representation of the Poincaré algebra. So it, it, it's still in some sense a relativistic model. Um, and another thing I want to uh, mention is that, that there's some kind of symmetry here. So um, the operators, uh, they acted very differently on the X and Y variables. You had these long shifts on the X variables and short shifts on the Y variables. Um, but you, there's actually some symmetry that kind of, um, yeah, counteracts that. So um, if we just interchange uh, the X and the Y variables and also interchange the parameter delta with minus kappa, I, I get some other operators acting on the same functions. So I denote them by D. Um, and then it turns out that the H's are actually a polynomial in the D's and vice versa. So in particular, they all commute with each other. So in, in that sense, the difference between these two types of variables uh, disappear. And you can even write explicit determinant formulas for say the H in terms of the D's. Um, so th this might remind you of these classical uh, relations between, uh, let's say, elementary symmetric polynomials and complete homogeneous symmetric polynomials. Um, it, it has something to do with that. Um, so I, I actually, in all, all in all, we have four infinite families of mutually, mutually commuting operators. So I mean, I've never mind the notations, but I had the ones I started with. I have somewhere I kind of reverse the direction of all the shifts. I have somewhere I flip the long and the short shifts, and I, I could also do both this at once. Um, th then I get four infinite families of operators, and they, all, all, everything in this family is commute with everything else. Of course, they are not all independent, but um, there's lots of operators uh, around here. Um, yeah, so I wanted to say something about the proof of commutativity. Um, so what I want to do is I, I want to prove that two of these things commute uh, when the orders here, K and L are different. And of course you could write, write down this operator identity and 
kind of uh, pull out the coefficient of uh, anything on the left and the right hand side and reduce it to some scalar equation. And this scalar equation has, I mean, it, it looks simple, but I, I have to tell you what S is. So S is then some complicated sum, um, which looks like this. So uh, maybe we shouldn't go into the details, but I mean, it, it's still like in the, in the Y variables, you have this Rosner's type stuff in the X variables, something that looks more hypergeometric than then some cross factors that are not uh, that difficult. So you have to prove that this big sum, and you see that the terms actually don't depend on k. All that depends on k is the range of summation. So you have to prove that this is actually the same thing if you replace this k by something else. Um, yeah, like, like the, 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 there's some symmetry in the order here. Um, so I mean, how, how do you prove something like that? Well, well you could go and look at what Rausnas did um, when he proved the special case here when, uh, when m is zero. Um, so when m is zero, when you don't have the first type of particles, then I mean, all, all these things involving x are gone. You only have this first double product. So then, then you need to prove that tk is say tr minus k, where, uh, sorry. So t, tk is this sum of theta functions, which maybe still looks complicated, but it, it's a lot simpler. So that, that's something that <clears throat> Gelsner's uh, proved and used to prove the commutativity of his original operators. And, and what you have to do is actually you just need the same identity. So you take this identity and then you make some substitution of all the variables. You specialize some of them to arithmetic progressions, others to other arithmetic progressions, and some of them you just leave as they are. And if you do that, you will see that a lot of the terms will vanish. And uh, because of these progressions, you, you can combine factors to these elliptic shift factorials. And if you do the computations, uh, you end up with this. I mean, this, this T thing becomes this much more complicated S thing. Uh, and the symmetry is, is exactly what you need. Um, so the, the idea is really quite simple. Um, you just have to do some computation to, to verify it. Um, and I also want to say something about the kernel functions. I mean, please interrupt me if you have any questions, uh, of course. Um, so kernel function, that, that has turned out to be quite a useful tool to study this, well, similar models. So in this context, the kernel function should be something that involves four groups of variables. So we, we have the original X and Y variables, then have some other kind of dual capital X and capital Y variables. And I imagine that um, the number of variables, that, that's just four different numbers here, M, R, N, and S. And then the kernel function would be such that if you act, if you act with your operator on the small X and Y, you get exactly the same thing as if you act with the operator on the capital X and Y. Um, and we can find such a kernel function if you have this relation between kappa and delta, or in multiplicative notation, uh, T and Q are like exponentials of these things. So it means that T to the M minus N is Q to the R minus S. And of course, one case that's interesting is when M is N and R is S, this holds automatically. Uh, but we think that there could also be other interesting cases. Um, and you could actually see some recent papers by Philippe van Dien and Thomas Gerbe, where they um, study, I mean, not, not, not the default model, but uh, the Rosner's model with these type of restrictions, and, and they find some finite dimensional reductions and relations to some fusion rings. And, and stuff. Um, so the, the, this, the, this type of relations could be interesting. Um, and he, here's the kernel function we have. So with this relation, it looks like, a, well, it's pr pretty simple products of things. Um, so here, this G delta is some solution to this functional equation. And you might know that you, you could, uh, can write down the solution to something like that in terms of the elliptic gamma function. 
Um, so the, this is basically the kernel function you would have in the not deformed case. Then you have something similar for the y variables and some cross factors, which are again, just products of theta functions, uh, quite simple things. Um, okay, so how, how do you prove that? Well, again, you just go back to, well, at, at least in retrospect, you, you go back to what Seaman already did. So um, in a paper from 2006, he proved this kind of functional identity in the undeformed case when you don't have M and N. Uh, and then what you need to prove is this identity, which you can also find in a paper by Kajihara and Umi. Um, so you, you need that identity. And again, that's all you need. You, you just take this thing and specialize all the variables to arithmetic progressions, or not all of them, but some of them. Uh, and you do the computation and see that what, what you get in the end, that, that's exactly the identity you need. Uh, that very simple idea. But um, the computation is a bit messy, but of, of course you, you can do it in finite time if, if you want to. Um, okay, so I, I think I'm, I'm probably speaking too fast. I will finish early, but um, I just want to say some things uh, about the relations here to elliptic hypertrometric functions. Um, so actually, um, so I, sh I showed you, um, I mean, maybe we can go back to this thing actually. So, 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 so to prove the commutativity, it was enough to look at the case when you just had these y factors, that, that's the Rosner's case. But it turns out that you could also look just at the case when you only have the x's and not the y factors. That identity will also imply uh, the full thing you need. Um, and that's another known thing. Um, so here we are. So that's this um, elliptic hypertrometric identity, which was found by Langer, Schlosser, and Barnard uh, in a paper. Uh, and you can then, I mean, also revert this, and you can say that um, the method we have gives a way to derive this identity from the Rosner's identity. So we obtain a, a slightly new proof of this thing. Um, and for the kernel functions, it's a similar thing that you can obtain the kernel function from some elliptic hypertrometric identity. Uh, so this one is, was found by Kajihara and Nomi and by myself. Uh, so, if, I mean, if, if you're not used to these things, they, they look horrible, but this is actually quite the standard thing. So it, it's like standard Milne type hypermetric series. Uh, th this one is quite unusual actually with, with this type of double product. Um, but the, the, this one is a much more common thing. Um, what's special about this is that you have different dimensions here on the left and right. You have n var summation variables on the left and n summation variables on the right. Uh, otherwise it's very symmetric. Okay, so if, if you know this thing that, that you know the kernel function identity as well. Um, and I, th I think some of you um, are more interested in integrals than finite sums, but that actually, always in this business, that there's some correspondence between sums and integrals. So if you have a sum, typically you have a corresponding integral and vice versa. Um, so the integral analog of the, here I just took the one dimensional Langer losses Barnard transformation that was given by van der Bult. Uh, and I, I actually didn't write it down properly, but I mean, one side is this type of integral. So here you integrate on, uh, over some contour in the complex plane. And the other side, it, it's basically the same thing, but you have to um, um, make, make some change of the parameters somehow. And here I actually wrote the definition of the elliptic gamma function. And if I have elliptic gamma functions with iterated argument, I, I just need a product of stuff. Um, and this has some applications in physics. So God and collaborators use this. I mean, basically what they do, they have, they have some four dimensional super conformal field theory. Uh, as you understand, they, they put this on some 
surface with holes in it. And then, then they have some index of this theory. And they say that the, this index is the same as a correlation function of some two-dimensional topological quantum field theory uh, on, on the surface. So like, I, I mean, like the, the holes will be like positions of particles. Um, and then the, this theory has some operator algebra associated to it. And then to prove that that algebra is actually associative, uh, that reduces to Van der Bolt's integral identity. Um, so that, that, there seems to be some pretty deep connections to physics here. Um, and you can say some similar things about the other one I showed you. So um, Reigns gave an integral transformation. You have some multiple integral like this, and, and the transformation says that this is equal to something similar, uh, but instead of, sorry, uh, n dimensions, you take m dimensions. So you, you shift, the, you change the dimension of the thing. Um, so that's the integral analog of this Kajihara noob identity I showed you that can, can be used to prove the kernel function identity. It also has some interpretation in physics. So in quite a classic paper by now, Dolan and Osman showed that both the sides of this identity can be interpreted as index identity for, as indices for different superconformal field theory. And then um, the fact that these are um, equal, that they, it, it expresses some duality between these two field theories. Um, so I mean, these kind of things make me wonder. So here are some questions that are, I mean, really very naive and maybe some of you can answer directly why, why it's uh, true or false. Um, but what, this makes me wonder if there's some families of commuting integral operators that you could think of as continuous analogs of the Röstner's operators. Um, so in, in my experience, I mean, if you, have a, if you have sums, you should also have integrals and vice versa. And, and you can even speculate that maybe these operators play some role for uh, superconformal field theories. Um, it's, it's just speculation, but it's something uh, maybe you could think about. Um, yeah, so I'm basically finished. So this, um, the talk is based on this first paper. So it, it's on the archive. You can have a look at it if you like. And, and we actually load wrote, I mean, this project led to two papers, which are kind of, um, they're kind of on a similar topic, but unrelated. So in uh, the second one, we have a kind of other um, direct approach that's really based on this kernel function identity but it only works in the trigonometric case. Um, and the second paper also can, contains more information on eigen functions that are kind of super McDonald polynomials. Um, okay, so that, that's everything I wanted to say. So I really end my talk very early. So I, I'm, I, I think it's, it's, it's probably because of this uh, online format that I, I talk way too quickly, but we, we have plenty of time for questions, if you have any. Thank you. Well, I'd like to ask uh, a question and I also have a comment. Yes. Uh, the question is about the original two particle, two types of particle Hamiltonian. Um, is it correct that you if you put in uh, dimensions and reality conditions that you're always winding up with particles that have opposite mass signs. In other words, is one of the particles positive mass and the other one negative mass, which is somewhat unsettling for a physicist. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't think about that, but I think, uh... Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry Edwin isn't here, but because I think he could answer, but um, yeah, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know if there's um, so, some simple way around this problem or not, uh, sorry. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe if you go to the, one of the first slides, then you, know, you can see more clearly what- uh, Yeah, I just, uh, I, I have two screens and I, I'm not so good at, uh, now I, I lost my mouth, that, there's my mouth. Um, Maybe Oleg, Oleg can comment on that because uh, it, the same thing happens with the simpler 
before yeah. Windows already. But I you, you, you wanted remember. the relativistic case, right? Or, or do you want even the differ differential case? Uh, like this one. Yeah, the relativistic the difference case. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he here it seems the masses are all positive if you just take G positive, right? Uh, but yeah, but relativistic case that's uh, if you're if you go back to that case, then you see that the kinetic energies have different signs, <laughs> didn't they? I mean, even there, uh, you mean here? No, I take that back. Yeah, I, I mean, the, yeah, the, this should be uh, fine if G is positive, right? Uh, yeah, you're so okay. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the, the relativistic case, I mean, to, to me, it's harder to see what, what is a mass and what is something else. I mean, if you look at the, this type of formula. It's, uh, yeah, here it's hard to see, but uh, yeah. I was really thinking of the simpler operators that Oleg uh, has introduced together with uh, Sasha Veselov. Um, yeah, I mean, the first order operates. I mean, if, if K is one, then, I mean, you, you, this takes a much more simpler form. So maybe, maybe that's... Uh, what we should yeah, look at. But, but here, here it's probably quite difficult to see that this this thing seems to crop up. Um, maybe it doesn't in this more general context. Maybe you can avoid it. But that's what I seem to remember from discussions with uh, Sasha Veselov uh, long ago, really, because these deformed operators have been around for quite a while. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, the, the comment I have is about um, this, well, conjectured existence of continuous analogs of these very uh, singular analytic difference operators. I would, I would be quite surprised if, if integral operators could, could have these same properties because typically they, they are bounded operators and um, you know, I cannot see in what way there would be analogs of these highly unbounded operators that incidentally you need for physical purposes. <coughs> the Hamiltonian and the momentum operator, they are unbounded because you you have no, no bound on the energy and the momentum. Yeah. So um, integral operators in general are far easier to handle from a functional analytic point of view, Hilbert space point of view, if you wish. Than, um, than these analytic difference operators. There's basically no theory for that. So um, yeah, well, it would be nice, but <laughs> the kernel functions of course do, do uh, a very good job of uh, making the analysis of the analytic difference operators from Hilbert space point of view uh, more manageable. I mean, this is partly what my talk is going to be about um, that, that I will give in. Well, I suppose now 15 minutes because we can actually now probably go to the original schedule where at least on my screen it says that uh, it starts at six. Well, not, not uh, of course, not Berkeley time, but uh, UK time. Or unless, uh, lot, unless there are a lot more questions, of course. May I ask the question? Yes, of course. Is there any role playing by super integrability of these kind of systems observed first by Vesilov and his co-authors? I mean the existence of extra operator, which is not symmetric, but rather anti-symmetric, which can be used with original Hamiltonian. Um, no, I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, what, what we had was this. Uh, where is it? I mean, we had we had the fact that the H's commute with these hatted operators, like like when you replace the parameters by the negatives. But I I don't think that could be considered as super integrability. So I, I think you mean. You, you mean something else that we haven't looked at, I think. Yes, super yeah. integrability is uh, maybe not a good term, but it's just in case of usual color mother system, there exists yeah. an extra operator. 
algebraically dependent, but not polynomially dependent on on the original one. I, I, ah, I, I see. If if I can if I can just chip in, so it's yes. uh, in this case, if you have a general case like that, then it's impossible to have this integ integral coupling parameters on on for both types of particles. So uh, I think then the best you can hope up this will be these apparatus are actually uh, symmetric in each group of particles, but 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 you still have something. Uh, non-trivial. The algebra is non-trivial, right? You can have the, the, there are lots of relations between them, uh, between these separators, like right. Okay, thank you. I have a question. May I ask? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I regained connection and hope to, to continue at least for a couple of minutes. Uh, what about the measure? With respect to which your operators are at least formally Hermitian, did you investigate them? Maybe I missed them in the talk, but could you please repeat this point? Uh, yes, so I, I think my, my co authors, I mean, Martin and Edwin, they, they have some work in progress on this, but I don't, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know what I can say about that, but uh, in our paper, it's, it's just. Uh, I mean, our, our paper is just algebraic, just formal properties. We don't discuss at all, like Hilbert space properties or. Uh, 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 it, it's more thing. towards it's more towards the integrals, uh, a kind of new elliptic of geometric integrals, which may emerge as just the measure. They, they represent a such type of a new type, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah, I understand. So you, you you want some measures? So these operators are formally self-adjoint uh, or. In the standard case, that's uh, it works. So I am curious whether in your case it may be working as well. Yeah. So uh, uh, it, it it's not in our paper, but I, I know I know it's something that my co-authors have been thinking about. Uh, so if I may, uh, the there is a yeah, proposed that, measure a in our paper. Yeah. So in our 2014 paper, we proposed a measure for the uh, deformed models, uh, even in the elliptic case. But it's not proven that it's. Uh, um, so it's f just formally, uh, but so in that paper you can find something given in terms of the elliptic gamma functions. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that that was exactly the answer to the question. Yeah, I, I didn't see that you were here, Farouk. Hey. If you go to the trigonometric case, are you able to find any um, any solutions in terms of deformed polynomials? Maybe yes, yes. Uh, in the deformed yeah. case, that is possible, right? So this is more general and possibly there are again some polynomial solutions. Yeah, yes. In, in the trigonometric case, that's uh, that, that's already in this paper by Feigen and Sedantia. So they have uh, some kind of super McDonald polynomials as eigenfunctions. Um, of course, the elliptic case, uh, it's much harder. I mean, even in the undeformed case, it's hard to study eigenfunctions, as you know, and we, we, we don't have any results on that uh -huh. really. Mm. So, so how about the kernel functions in that trigonometric case? Do they do they play the same role as kind of a generating function for these polynomials? Have you looked at that? Yeah, yeah, they, they do. I mean, that's that, that's what the second paper. I mean, I, I said we had two papers, and uh, the, the second paper is that I didn't talk about. That that's about these kind of things. Um, so, for the, in the trigonometric case, we could write down. Uh, Where's the kernel functions? I mean, th then we have kernel functions also without these conditions. Um, and there are, yeah, in, in, in some sense, they, they are like generating function for some super McDonald polynomials, for sure. Yeah, but I'm really asking about your sense. Can you really find the expansion coefficients explicitly? Uh, you mean for the... Yeah, I think there's some pretty explicit things in that paper. Um, uh, 
Okay, thanks. I'll, yeah, I'll look at yeah. It. But if, I mean, all, all, also in the early paper by Fagin and Slanchev, I mean, they. Uh, okay, no, no, they they don't have the kernel function, I guess. So uh, yeah, that's why I was asking because I don't think yeah. they they have the kernel function. Hmm. Sorry, if I may comment. Um, yeah. I think the paper by uh, Sergey and Veselov um, talks about this expansion with uh, explicit coefficients. So, so do they have a kernel function? I, I can't yeah, so they are using um, this restriction on the McDonald kernel function to obtain the super version. Aha. Uh -huh. Ah, yeah, by going to infinitely many variables. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, now that you're saying it, yeah, I, I, I can't remember this now myself. Yeah, I'm very rusty on these things. Mm. Yeah, I, I also think the, 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 these things work quite nicely in the trigonometric case, but in, uh, in, in the Leafly case, it's much harder. And, and I mean, we, we don't even have the kernel function as, as general as we would like. Uh, yeah, so maybe I can, uh, I can stop sharing this. Um, Yeah, so any, any other questions for me or, or should I go back to being some kind of chairman? Yeah. So I think Simon, your suggestion was that we start the next talk. I mean, at the hour, but yeah, then- that, yeah. that is really what it said on the schedule. So I was a little surprised that you said that it was 10 minutes past the hour. Yeah, I mean, now on the schedule, it says, on the schedule on the internet, it says 10 past the hour. So I think maybe if you start at the hour, then maybe some people will come 10 minutes late. Well, again, uh, what, what uh, Peter sent me is that they start on the hour. So I'm a bit surprised that you're saying this. I got it today. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm looking at the workshop homepage, uh, so. Yeah, but the link I, he sent today yeah. Um, it's at researchseminars.org slash seminars slash elliptic 2022. And there yeah. it, it uh, says for all the talks that they start on the hour. Okay, interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but let, let's, I mean, let, let's start on the hour then. Uh, yeah, well, unless. If, 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 uh, if, I mean, if, if you don't mind the. Uh, I don't mind. And no. I, I wonder what people look at, you know, I mean, the people who got this uh, message today, if they looked at the message, they will have seen that it was scheduled on the hour. So that's yeah. why. Okay, so we, we, we start in, in six minutes now. So o on the hour, un unless someone is in India, because in India, it's on the half hour. Oh, wow. Yeah. Depending on where you are, probably. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I, I sometimes I think... go to some seminars, I mean, on, online seminars in India, and that, then you have to remember this, that it's, uh, yeah, but they may have the, the difference is one. like a, a half number of hours. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they probably have more than one time zone. Apparently there they use half hours. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I, I got an email message from uh, Peter, so uh, I, I will reply that uh, we are fine.
So Yalmar, let me try and share my screen because I, at previous occasion, I had a bit of a trouble with that. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, that's that's okay. Yeah, that, end, that is. <laughs> yeah. You got that? Yeah, it looks fine. Uh, yeah. It, it's not in full screen, but uh, I mean, it, it's you, you can have it like that if you like. Uh, it's I have full screen myself, but uh, what I cannot remove is this this black um, this black thing on top that tells you all the possibilities. You know, like uh, uh, no, but I mean, I, I see the whole PDF reader <laughs> with. I mean, there's stuff with that okay. Adobe Export PDF and. Uh, yeah, there must be some I, way to, to remove mm -hmm. that, but I'm not very good at the Zoom stuff. No. But I think it's a matter of that you have to share the right window. Because if, if you go to full screen, it kind of opens the PDF in another window. So that, then you have to share that one instead of sharing the PDF reader. Um, but you do have to, the full screen, right? On your, on your end. I have the full screen here. No, no, I, I don't see the full screen. I, I see. Uh, oh, ah, I see. Yeah. Um, hang on. Well, how do I do that? <laughs> Well, there you are. I'm not very good at this. Yeah. No, um, I, I think if, if you want it, you, you need to say, take stop share and then see if you can share some other window. Um, um, well, what can I say? I mean, what I can do is at least this. Yeah, yeah, that's better. That's all better, right? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, this is perfectly fine, I think. Yeah, because um, you can do it like that. Yeah, second, there must be also some way to do it at the full screen. But if I have full screen, then I don't know how to access Zoom. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's going to be a little tricky. Anyways, uh, this is fine. This is uh, okay. Yeah, it looks great. Um, so you, you are you ready to start? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So the next. The next talk is Simon Rosenars, and he will talk about Rasamats A2 and A3 kernel identities. So may I, we will see if everyone in the conference has, has the title of another speaker in the, the name of another speaker in the title or or not. Um, yeah, but go go on. Okay, well, thanks. Yeah. So uh, yeah, this uh, this is a talk that and a paper that would not be uh, possible would not have been possible without. Uh, Shlomo Razamat's uh, prodding. <laughs> I'm very grateful to him. He uh, found his, his identities in the course of his work on super conformal uh, quantum field theories. And um, in that setting, you're not completely sure that, that they're correct because uh, there are some partly heuristic uh, steps along the way. So he asked me uh, whether he had seen these. Uh, these identities before, and um, you know whether I would know a proof, an analytic proof. And at first, I I really had trouble believing uh, their validity uh, because they are of a novel type, as I hope to make clear. And um, so it took some back and forth, and uh, it was especially the uh, numerical um, validation that Shlomo presented that that really swayed me. Uh, that was so impressive that I knew it had to be true. Uh, anyways, um, so here's the outline. Uh, it's just kind of straightforward. Uh, I'll have a rather long introduction and then I sketch the proof uh, for the two cases involved. And then I come to a conjectured way of understanding these uh, kernel identities in terms of Hilbert space. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> so, of course, uh, Yalmar has already mentioned kernel identities here is a, a general definition. It's actually 
a bit specialized because you can also have different dimensions for V and W. Uh, so you have two Hamiltonians and they're connected uh, in this way by this kernel function S. Okay, so uh, if you go to the Kaloja Rosa and Tota type uh, quantum integrable systems and particle systems, then these kernel functions have, have long been known now um, at all levels, really. <clears throat> and in particular, if you go to the highest level in this hierarchy, which is the elliptic relativistic case, then you wind up with the Hamiltonians that we have seen in uh, Yalmar's talk. Um, and the kernel function takes this form, where B is basically the coupling. Okay, so um, here you have coefficients for the analytic difference operators that depend only on differences. And it's a pair uh, interaction structure that uh, gives rise to uh, the root system a n minus one. So this invariance under the while group of that root system as n. And uh, now in the case that Shlomo Razumat found, you have a similar relation to uh, these two special cases of A2 and A3, but what's new here is that you, you do not get this in case you let the, uh, the positions as I tend to view them uh, vary arbitrarily. You actually need to make the center of mass constraint and uh, that's, that's the, the novel uh, thing about it. So the kernel functions look uh, pretty much uh, similar to the one that we had on the previous slide, except that uh, we have extra, extra parameters. So here there's a symmetry between V, W, and Z. That's the A2 case. And then there's this little, little shift. And um, here there's again a shift slightly different in the A3 case. And then there is this uh, two parts of it. I made a convention on the previous slide, right? Here, this is a convention that's quite standard now but I didn't mention it explicitly. So that's used here. So here we have this extra parameter D, which is just a complex number. So here we have a one parameter family of kernel functions, whereas here really V, W and Z are on the same footing, right? So this already is, is rather unusual. So those are the kernel functions. Now, um, the elliptic gamma function I'm using is not of the uh, multiplicative form that Yama was using, but rather of this, this additive form in the sense that the, um, the analytic difference equations are not Q difference equations, but they're, they're additive, right? You shift uh, just the, the positions uh, by adding something instead of having a Q. Um, of course, um, that's easily uh, connected by making this exponential here just into a new variable, say y, right? All these all these exponentials uh, would then uh, disappear, and you would have the q's, um, and you would have the y that you saw in uh, Yalmar's slide. There's also a slight shift with this uh, convention that goes back to my paper in '97. Um, and that's why I'm using this convention still. I, I always get confused with the more uh, common uh, later conventions in terms of the Q, uh, the Q uh, terminology convention, if you wish. So in this setting, I am taking R throughout positive. Um, if you take also the real part of the scale parameters positive, then of course this converges very nicely. And you see it's a pi on R periodic meromorphic function, very simple reflection equation. And it's obviously it's invariant under swapping A plus and A minus, which is nowadays referred to as modular invariance. Now, um, again, uh, the, uh, the building block of the coefficients is just, uh, just basically a Jacobi theta function, but also here I found it 
imperative in the setting of my paper of 97 to introduce a new notation because there's so many different conventions for theta functions. So I, I just uh, looked at the function that appears as the right hand side of this uh, first order analytic difference equation, which is just infinite product. And that's that's really a uh, rescaled uh, Jacobi theta function. And um, it's the one that's that's uh, even uh, and entire, of course, uh, without real zeros. So it's the uh, the generalization of the cosine of the, the trigonometric cosine. Whereas later on, I will at one point or rather two points, I will have also the generalization of the uh, trigonometric sine, which is just uh, gotten by a shift of this times an exponential. But I will not introduce that explicitly. That will be, um, it didn't, didn't fit anywhere. I use it only in two formulae. Now, here uh, are the uh, analytic difference operators in the A2 case. So again, this is this product uh, convention. And uh, here you already see that I'm going to the center of mass frame and this shift will leave uh, functions that depend only uh, on uh, differences and not on the center of mass variable uh, invariant and uh, that's that's important soon so um, these are the kernel identities but uh, there are three of them because we have this symmetry between V, W, and Z. And um, the key point is now, as I already mentioned, that this is not valid unless you have this sum restriction, this center of mass restriction. The same is true for the A3 case. There we have, uh, again, uh, difference dependence dependence on, on difference variables so that's why you get the uh, the uh, the a3 root system from permutation invariant in four variables and likewise here these are these are just the cyclic permutations right it makes it uh, it makes it permutation invariant so um here we have this one parameter family of kernel functions with the parameter d as opposed to this vector z that we had in the a2 case right it's on the same uh, footing as v and w so here the situation is different in that regard you have a one parameter family of um, of kernel functions whereas the analytic difference operators are just uh, they they don't have a parameter so um this is uh, again different from um, the case of the closure Moses system. You have just one here, and it's an open problem whether there are commuting analytic difference operators in this A3 setting that also satisfy this kernel identity. But uh, notice that we have here this free parameter D, so we have a large family of integral operators. And later on, I will argue that they're very likely to commute. So there is, there is, in a sense, still integrability here, uh, except that it's conjectural. Now, again, this is really the surprise. Um, if you, if you are used to the the previous operators, then uh, you of course try to to prove first that it's true in uh, the unrestrained case. And there you quickly see it's not true. So um, then you have to go to this uh, center of mass system. And that means that you have to, as you want to prove it, you have to single out one of the variables and write it as minus the sum of the other ones. <coughs> and that's why it gets really tricky, <coughs> as you will see. So in particular, although I found uh, a proof for the A2 case, the elliptic case, I, I could not push that through for the A3 case. <clears throat> it just got too gory. There, there are so many, so many residues and it, it got really too, too, uh, too uh, unwieldy. So 
I, I left it that uh, that, prog that that program. It, it's very likely true, mind you. Slomo had these uh, uh, these tests with uh, Q expansions, and uh, it's, there's no doubt that they hold true. But there's it's so far no no analytic proof. However, I. Uh, in desperation, turn to the hyperbolic case, and there, yes, I could prove it, but in another way, because you, if you would have followed the same route, then you would have again this problem of too many, too many residues and too unwieldy formulae. So it's a different proof, but it does not uh, extend to the elliptic case, unfortunately, because it involves asymptotics, looking at asymptotics, and that that is no nothing. Uh, there's nothing al analogous for that in the elliptic case. You, you'll see. Now uh, that's that's the uh, the two sections with some some rather gory stuff. Um, and I should already said uh, say at the outset that I apologize for it because these are very bad proofs. <laughs> I mean, I, I would never have embarked on even trying to prove this if I wouldn't have believed um, on on the grounds of. Uh, Shlomo's uh, proddings and uh, calculations, computer calculations, that they had to be true. But these, these proofs are not, are not the right proofs. Um, there must be another way to look at these identities. Uh, of course, the super conformal quantum field theory gives it other way, but uh, there you have the problem that it's, it's not quite rigorous. So I have the feeling that there is maybe a way to look at this in terms of elliptic hypergeometric integrals or well some other way where where the proof is not so uh, what can I say so so hands-on so um, gory is perhaps the best word you'll see that it's it's unpalatable but you know it's a proof now um, then there are two sections where I speculate on how you can uh, reinterpret these kernel identities in terms of Hilbert space. And there you need to make reality restrictions. In particular, you need to choose the scale parameters positive, right? Remember that in the setting of the elliptic gamma function, of course, you, you only need real parts that are positive. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll come back to the circumstantial evidence for these conjectures. Um, that, that really is, that hinges on previous work uh, with Hilbert Schmidt operators and uh, using them to, uh, to understand eigenfunctions of analytic difference operators in, in uh, several settings actually, where you wouldn't be able to say anything otherwise. So, as I mentioned already, as a comment in Yalmer's talk, this is really a godsend that there are these uh, kernel functions because they enable you to, to at least push through, in some cases, the uh, functional uh, analysis, the Hilbert space theory for, for analytic difference operators. Of course, there are, there are other cases where, where you have explicit uh, Solutions like the polynomial case, the trigonometric case, right? But that's that's a very special case, and you lose this at the elliptic level, right? So let's then um, take a look at this proof for the for the A two case, and we have modular invariance, so you need only look at one value for the index delta. I'm going to abbreviate this Jacobi theta function by x with round brackets. Uh, Yalma was, was also using this abbreviation with, with uh, square brackets, right? And this, uh, this shift parameter, half the shift parameter, I will cause T, I will, I will use T for that. And then it's convenient to have uh, yet another uh, multiple of IA plus that I call C. Okay, now what do you do? You want to show that this function here that you get by acting on uh, S2 of, of V and W uh, is actually symmetric in V and W. So you act with this guy and then it should be symmetric uh, in V and W because that, that is the proof that you need, all right? Because what do you do uh, uh, to check the kernel identities? You act with 
the, the operator that has V and you let it act and you get seemingly other functions, but actually they are the same. So um, we are going to monkey around with that function you get to bring it in a form so that we can actually embark on a proof of equality. So here that works by dividing by this product of uh, gamma functions with this particular shift that uh, I will soon, uh, uh, well, actually I can explain it now. It's that, that because you have in the plus uh, operator, you have minus shifts, okay? And they go over this for the, uh, for, for two of the three variables. That's why this goes out. Parts, parts of these gamma functions just go out. And what you're left with, if you use the uh, analytic difference equations for the gamma function, is just this, this uh, expression, this function in terms of, uh, in terms of just the Jacobi theta function. So that's the first step. And of course, this, the cyclic uh, uh, versions of the uh, term here, the summand here has to uh, have to be added. So you get three terms. Okay, now we do what we do, in, do next. We, we want to divide this by this product so that we get a function L where we can uh, start looking at uh, poles and residues. <coughs> so um, this is what you get if you um, cancel some of these gamma functions. And then the whole question boils down to, is this function symmetric under swapping V and W? Now it's, it's not hard to see that it's not true if you do not restrict V and W. And one way to see it is that you, you view it as a mere morphic function of V1. And then you have uh, six terms with generically simple poles there's always genericity, right? I mean, just special cases where you get multiple poles, but uh, that, that's uh, non-generic. So if you look at the first pole around, which is when V1 is equal to V2 up to the lattice, the elliptic lattice, then for, for K equal to zero, the residue sum indeed vanishes. So that looks good, but as soon as you go to the next one, it's not zero. So the first test already tells you, no, it's not true. It's, it, it cannot be true in uh, unrestricted case. Now there's yet another way that uh, is perhaps even more telling and also shows how remarkable it is that it is true for the uh, restricted case, namely to look at uh, the multipliers of these uh, six terms when you shift over the uh, the imaginary period. You can use the, uh, the analytic difference equation for the, for the theta function to pull, uh, to pull uh, all these uh, multipliers out. And what, what comes out of that is that you get all sorts of multipliers. You get for these L terms, you get these. So you have two and eight and eight. And for R, they're the same, but they're six. So they're very different. These are just uh, multipliers that do not depend on V1. So already here you see that also from this point of view, they cannot possibly be the same. These functions L and R are not the same if you uh, do not insist on this uh, sum condition. From now on, we're going to require it. And we're going to put x3 equal to minus x1 to minus x2 to uh, implement that. And lo and behold, then you get for all six terms the same multiplier. That's the multiplier. So now we have a six variable function. And um, it's pi on, part, uh, pi on R periodic. And now it's also 2T quasi-periodic in V1. Now that quasi-periodicity enables you to conclude that you need only prove 
that the residue sums vanish at the, the poles. That's, that's a well-known uh, thing about uh, these quasi-periodic functions that that's enough. So to look at the poles at uh, issue, the two types, there are poles that do not depend on W and they're easily handled. Be straightforward. So here are the, uh, the half letters. Something is coming up. Online security starts with a click. Do you get that too? <laughs> My screen is, is different now. I'll click it away. Yeah, I, I didn't notice anything, but. Nothing happens at your end. Can you still see the, the, the Yeah, screen? yeah, it, it, it's fine. Uh... I think, yeah, I mean, it, it, what because you saw was not in the PDF reader, so then, then yeah, we it is, it. it is my, um, my VPN that's sort of uh, giving stuff on my screen, but it's okay on, at your end, apparently. Yeah, Very yeah, good. it's fine. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sorry, because I was worried that uh, your screen was also obscured. So these V poles um, that don't involve W, um, they, they are easily handled. So these are the nasty ones. Or rather, there's only one. But uh, you know, when we start looking at residues, then we will see that uh, we need to go to V2, and, and then the, the poles start prolif proliferating. I mean, even, even though we have made this constraint, there's, of course, still this, this S3 symmetry around. It's just that it looks a little different in these difference variables. So that's why we need only look at this uh, this one pole, and um, so that's where we let's see. But now, oh yes, okay, yes. I had not VPN. <laughs> now, now this will work. I couldn't uh, I couldn't use my leafing anymore, but now it should work. Yes, it does. Okay. So again, this this V uh, the V dependent uh, poles they're they're easily taken care of, <laughs> but uh, this this is the nasty one. So then both L the restricted L and the restricted R have um, have two residue summons that are non-zero, and they, they'll really look look quite. Uh, quite bad. There are quite a lot of common factors, but even if you if you cancel them, then you you have two two sums for LR and R subscript R that look really very, very far from equal. What's true though is that these functions now viewed as uh, miromorphic Pi on R periodic function of V2, they have the same multiplier if you shift V2 by the imaginary period. So it's once more enough to show that the residue sums at the V2 poles are equal. Now then you get quite a number of V2 poles. That is, that is why, you know, it's, 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 it's already from that point of view more work, we had just one V1 pole, remember? But then if you want to show that these residues are equal, then you, you get a lot of poles for V2. V1 is out now, right? So um, there are two types, sorry, there are two types. The first type, you have only poles coming from, from L and that's uh, like the previous case uh, where we had uh, also little work to do. That's that's the easy case, okay? Whereas the second type, you uh, you get just one residue term uh, for, no, you get two terms for L, but you, you have now have two cases for, for, for R. In the first case, R has, uh, has only one term that uh, 
only one non-zero residue term. And, and then that's simple. So it's the remaining case that involves all of, well, almost all of the work. Um, and, and that's where, you know, I'm saying this is not, this is not the right way to prove it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's not not the right proof, but it's a proof. It, it's quite long, and uh, it's, it's not conceptual. It, it doesn't it doesn't tell you why it's true. So sorry about that, but uh, I hope that's the challenge. <laughs> um, I don't give you even the details here because these expressions are so long. Whereas for the hyperbolic case um, in the A three setting, I will give some some uh, some more. Formulae. Now, uh, let's first follow the same flowchart. Now, with this uh, other constant, then by going through the same motion, so we act with uh, a depending on v on the kernel function, divide by an appropriate quotient. Uh, uh, that's a product of um, of gamma functions so that the gamma functions all go out so that you can use the uh, the analytic difference equations and everything boils down to an expression in terms of the jacobi theta functions so here it is and with this product convention there are now four terms right we have uh, four variables so again it's not true that when you swap V and W in this expression and you have no constraint on these two vectors that you get the same result. So I won't, I won't go into that, it's not hard to show. So we have to impose this to have a chance that the kernel identity holds true. So again, we get then six variable functions, right? We now have no longer a Z, we have V and W, and uh, we get rid of uh, V4 and W4 by writing them as minus the sum of the other ones. So we have now again, six variable functions. And this is very encouraging. Uh, if you look at these uh, four terms, then you get again, the same multiplier if you shift V1 over the imaginary period. So this certainly goes in the direction of, yeah, it might be true. Yeah, well, it is, it is true, but I cannot prove it. Uh, it, would, it would be in principle possible to go the same route, but first you have this uh, V1 pole that depends on W is just one, but then you need to go to the V2 poles and there are lots of them, but that's not enough because, because then everything still depends on V3. And you get even more pole terms for V3 and it, it just gets too hairy for me at least. So uh, that's, that's where I gave up on that. So there's, there's no complete proof for the elliptic case. And I cannot do it also going this avenue in the hyperbolic case. There's really not much of a uh, simplification if you would go along that road. But here in the hyperbolic case, there is, there is another way to do it. And that involves uh, asymptotic analysis. And there's no analog of that for the elliptic case. So I cannot extend that proof to the elliptic case. So let's take a look at that. The hyperbolic version of the elliptic L that you saw there is, is right here. So these are cautious and these are singes. And remember, I fixed the choice of period. So again, this is a shorthand that uh, will uh, make it possible to, uh, to get formulae on one line. Now, even in this case, it's not the case that it's symmetric under the interchange of V and W. It might be here because the proof uh, 
for the elliptic case that they're not equal falls true. So you have to look at it in a slightly different way to see they're not equal. Now, if you now make this restriction, however, then we will be able to show the kernel identities. So in the end, the, the restricted functions are equal, but they cannot show that directly, right? It, it, they, must be, they must be actually equal, but uh, it, I cannot see that directly. It's a consequence of the, the validity of the kernel identities that we prove in another way. So how do we do that? Well, first we, we monkey around a bit with uh, multiplying by appropriate factors. So then you get this. And so you can then combine some, some uh, stuff in the, uh, in the numerator to, to write this as a polynomial in, in B actually, where B is this, this new uh, quantity. It's just a trigonometric uh, addition formula. Okay, that, that's all there is to it. So we need to restrict this to this uh, center of mass uh, case and show that this function, when you swap V and W, uh, is the same as invariant. Now, what is the key here is that you have actually IA plus periodic functions of V1, and they have limit zero. And when you take the real part of V1 to plus or minus infinity, Again, this is, this is one way to see it. It's not true if you would not have this restriction. You can see that already right away here because you have uh, four of these two V1 factors and here you have only three in that case. But because we have the sum uh, restriction, V4, V4 is actually minus two V1 plus minus two V2 plus minus two V3. So you get here four V1. So you see already that this is a finite limit. Yeah, it's a finite limit. And so um, actually, if you look now at the cyclic terms, then actually the limit turns out to be zero. Okay. Well, that means that again, we, we need only look at residues at, uh, at the poles, at the V1 poles in the period strip now, right? Because we have periodicity as opposed to the quasi periodicity that we had in the elliptic case. Even this is not true. Uh, it's quite, quite amazing that if you have not this constraint then one of the functions uh, is, is, uh, is IA plus periodic, and on the other one is a, a, IA plus anti periodic. <laughs> so uh, it's because of that restriction that you get this, this equality in period. Okay, the six arch poles, and this is the, the first most obvious one. So what we do is we multiply by the cos and then put V1 equal to this sifted V2. And this is the result of that. So that's the residue. And this is what you get if you do that for the restricted FR. So that's the first case of six poles. And it came as a surprise to me that if you look at the five other cases, they lead to actually the same functions. So you need only show the equality of this and that. This may be because of this S4 invariant still being around, but I couldn't really derive it from that. Um, so that's a bonus. I mean, <laughs> you need only look at the equality of these two functions. And that is uh, gory enough. Um, so what we do is again, we, we can simplify matches by multiplying by this R, RL denominator so that you get just this simple expression, which is a polynomial in B, 
and the only non-zero coefficients are b and b cubed, right? You see that you see that right away. So we have here just two non-zero coefficients. But now look at what you get if you do that for the other function. Then at face value, you have here a polynomial again of the fourth degree, but it looks as if all the coefficients are, are non-zero. So if they are equal, then it must be the case that the coefficient when, when b is equal to zero, that this whole thing is, is zero. And likewise for b squared and b to the fourth. So for b to the fourth, you just wind up with this plus cyclic permutations. And that's an identity that we get later on. But you can actually conclude it at this point when you would know that they're equal. We don't know that yet. So here is one way to prove this equality. Here we have no dependence on V3 at all. Whereas here it's all over the place, right? There's lots of v V3s in, in each of these cyclic terms. So you, you got to show, well, well that's one way to, to go about doing this, this wrong proof. <laughs> you, you have to show that this is not dependent on V3. And that can be done. Okay, but that, that's not something I am going to, uh, to sketch. Of course, I'm giving you the uh, reference to the paper at the end. So then we are allowed to take V3, any value that, that is convenient. Well, um, it turns out to be simplest to take V3 to infinity. And then you get this, this polynomial. And this one indeed has uh, only coefficients for, for B and B cubed, right? So that already matches. But you see from the comparison that, that here, if this is equal to that, you get already some stunning identities, right? You get three identities just by comparing this and that. That I will not, it's only the one where you get, uh, where, you, um, where you look at the B to the fourth coefficient that will come up later because there all these, this whole bunch of things goes out. You could just get the sum of these, uh, these coefficients of the shifts because that's what this is. This is just a coefficient of the shift. So some of these coefficients vanish and uh, vanishes. And that just means that when you act with the analytic difference operator on the constant function, you get eigenvalue zero. That's what that tells you, okay? Anyways, we still have to compare this, expand, expand it out to that. So if we put uh, X equal to two V2, then you get these two identities. It's the B and the B cubed term that we have to compare. And here they are. And they're all true, but again, they're, they're not true. If uh, you don't have this sum condition of W, and it's actually quite a bit of work to show this. These two identities do hold, but you would never, uh, you would never arrive at them if you if you weren't coming along this path of uh, knowing that what you're trying to prove is true, because you you would you would not even believe this to be true, uh, because it's obviously false if there's no restriction on W. But it's the, su the sum restriction of W that's, that makes this whole true, like this here. Now, this is what I said before. Uh, we could already conclude that from the previous slide. And this just says that uh, these, these analytic difference operators acting on the constant function annihilate the constant functions. Okay. Right. So this is the proof. And uh, I'm uh, challenging all of you who take an interest in such things to come up with a better one, because this is, this is uh, not a very conceptual proof, admittedly. 
Anyways, we talk, we're talking eigenfunctions, eigenvalues. So that brings us to Hilbert space. What, what is this trying to tell you, in my opinion? Well, let's first look at these two operators because they, in the A2 case, for different mu's. We have already seen that, uh, yes, they, they satisfy the kernel identity independently of mu. So from that point of view already, you, you think, well, they might, they might well commute and they do. But again, that's not obvious. Uh, there, there's actually a theta function identity involved in showing this that is possibly new. I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, again, if you expect it to hold true, it's not that hard to prove. So th that's the, that's the uh, statement here, right? This, this is very easily shown if you have uh, just this and uh, these different indices here, then it's, it's just the crazy periodicity of the coefficients that makes it possible to check that right away. It's this where you have just the same, the same uh, index here. That's the hard part. Well, not so hard, but again, you would also, you wouldn't expect it to, to be true if you see it. Uh, it's just that you expect it from uh, Shlomo's work that uh, you, you can actually rather easily prove this theta function identity. Now, this uh, question of formal self jointness came up in Yalmar's talk already. Here also, that's a natural question to ask. And uh, Tromo actually also answers it already. Uh, he used uh, uh, also this form with an elliptic gamma function written in this uh, Q form. Uh, and actually, you can simplify it by using. Uh, again, the analytic difference equations for the elliptic gamma function it gets this simpler form. So this is the other data function I alluded to when I introduced the right hand side functions that were even and had no poles. This this is the data function that is odd and uh, has uh, poles on the real axis. So it's, it's basically the sigma function, but made. Uh, made periodic in the real direction, okay? And of course, with particular scalings and uh, conventions as regards uh, behavior to origin, but you can think of it as, as the sigma function. And this is just an infinite product uh, constant, okay? Depending on the two scale parameters. So, um, we need to make this similarity transformation to go to Hamiltonians that are not even, they are not only formally self adjoint with respect to Rubeck measure, restricted to this, this uh, set G2. I should really comment on this a little more. So we order the, uh, the three positions and we insist on this sum convention. So we are on a hyperplane or other plane. We are in three space, so it's a plane. And um, this, this is the, um, the Rubeck measure restricted to that plane. And you need, I mean, this is Hilbert space. We want formal uh, self adjoinders And then you need to choose mu either real or purely imaginary. And if you go through the motions of simplifying this uh, so that you um, get rid of um, this asymmetry that is still in A by pushing terms through, then you can see actually that you have uh, formal positivity in the sense that the, the difference operators in the middle, that's, that's a, a formally positive operator. And on the left and the right hand side, you have two positive functions, okay? And they're, they're equal. So um, it's a sum of such terms rather. So that suggests that uh, you, you will get positive eigenvalues, which is better than just uh, uh, having formal self-jointness. You know a little more what to expect. Now here is uh, how you now hope to use these kernel functions. 
you want to make up an integral operator by using them in this way. So here we integrate over G2. So this is the restricted Lebesgue measure. And we sit on this Hilbert space. And because of this similarity transformation, we now go to, uh, to this uh, transformed kernel. And we want to keep the symmetry in V, W, and Z. So that's why this factor is there. So now, and this is a key point. It's immediate that this integral operator is Hilbert Schmidt for all Z in G2. And Hilbert Schmidt operators have been understood for more than a century. You know their singular value decomposition exists. So you know that there are special functions in Hilbert space that gives you uh, orthonormal functions. Uh, I'll come to that on the next slide, but here, right, right here is, is the key for, for this whole idea that you can use these kernel functions to, to get operators that are far more amenable to rigorous analysis than these analytic difference operators. And um, that's because Hilbert Schmidt operators are so, so simple in structure. There's this dependence on Z, and the expectation is that you actually have commutativity when Z and Z prime are varying over this configuration space. Now, we also expect Sagana conjecture that the associated orthonormal functions are actually complete. That's not something I can prove. I can prove it in other settings, in the Calogero Moses settings for these kernel functions viewed as Hilbert Schmidt operators, that they actually complete. I mean, you have an integral operator, it's Hilbert Schmidt, but what you do not know is that uh, its null space is trivial. It could be, uh, it could be an infinite dimensional uh, null space. You just know that there's a single value decomposition that involves orthonormal functions. But from the previous work that I've been alluding to, uh, you actually expect that you will get basis for your Hilbert space and that these eigenfunctions of the Hilbert Schmidt operators will actually be shared by the Hamiltonians and that they will have positive eigenvalues, of course, under this reality restriction. If that is true, that then that actually also automatically promotes them to bona fide the commuting salvage joint operators on this space, which is the key problem in quantum mechanics. Yes, you have commuting operators, but what they're formal. They're, they're just analytic difference operators. They, they don't like Hilbert space at all. You don't want to, you don't want to go off the, the, real, uh, the reals. Uh, and that's what, Hilbert, that's what uh, analytic difference operators do. They, they shift you into the complex. So you know right away that you will have some very special dense domains <coughs> of functions that allow that extension for these operators to be bona fide Hilbert space operators, but you cannot ever find these dense domains right away if there is these complicated, uh, complicated uh, coefficients. So that's that's the whole problem. That that, that, that that's the reason. Main the main reason there's no good theory for for these uh, analytic difference operators. They are not even pseudo differential operators because the symbols increase exponentially. Pseudo differential operators have been studied widely, but they're not even that. So it's, it's a very singular class of operators from the Hilbert space point of view. And that's why these, these uh, kernel functions via their Hilbert Schmidt associated integral operators are such a godsend. <clears throat> now, um, here is this expansion that I mentioned before. And because of the symmetry in V, W, and Z of the kernel, the coefficient up front, uh, a priori depends on, on Z, but it must be depending on Z in this way because, because of the symmetry. So if you just fix Z, then 
the existence of this expansion is just what I alluded to before. That's what Hilbert and Schmidt knew more than 100 years ago. So um, that's, uh, that's why, why it's such a nice starting point. The problem is that these are Hilbert space functions. You don't know anything else at this point. You know the existence of this, this orthonormal uh, set of functions, that it is a basis of conjecture. That's the completeness that I referred to before. For all you know, for sure, it might even be a finite rank kernel. Not extreme, extremely unlikely, but you know, this, the sum might actually only go to a, a finite big M. Well, again, it's a conjecture that that's not the case. It's an infinite set of uh, non-zero Cs, but actually that these functions are, are a base. The orthonormality is just a, a question of normalization. That, that's why you can, you can also put this Cn equal to a positive number, right? It's just a matter of choosing phases here. So this is, this is an important point that this, this already follows just from the hilbert schmidt property. So you have something to start with. You, you, you know these, these uh, JNs exist. And there's no guarantee at all that eigenfunctions exist for these analytic difference operators, you know, eigenfunctions in Hilbert space. So the obvious, the obvious ones to look at now are these JNs. Because that would explain the kernel identity. If you act on them, and yes, you get an eigenvalue here and you get an eigenvalue there, they're the same function, so the same eigenvalue. Okay, so it explains it. And so that's the Hilbert space interpretation of the kernel function identity. Right, so here is what you expect as well, again from previous work, that although they're at first defined as Hilbert space functions, actually they're very nice. They, they, are, they are actually restrictions to this, this real set of meromorphic functions, uh, meromorphic, in this restricted uh, plane in C3. Maybe even uh, they extend to, to all of C3, but that, that's not something that I would put much money on. But this should be the case. This follows from the fact that the kernel function itself is not real like in the Kaloser Moser case with the physical choices of the variables, real, real V uh, and, and W. But it does have um, a property of when your complex conjugate is taking, just like taking V, W, and Z to, to, the, to minus, minus these, these variables. So this, this is what you, what you expect. So they're not real, whereas in the in the closure Moses setting, you expect real eigenfunctions. This is a consequence of what we have already uh, conjectured, because this is just a finite Hilbert Schmidt norm. Okay. Remember this is z variable, and if you take the Hilbert Schmidt norm, the square integrability of uh, the function, the kernel function, in terms of v and w, but then what you get is just this for that for that integral, right? So we know it's finite because again, we have smooth functions on a bounded set. So square integrability is, is immediate. That's, that's the, the Hilbert Schmidt property. You read it off, you, there's, no, there's no work needed. So finally, this is what you expect for uh, the eigenvalues. They should be positive. Now, last remark on this case, um, here we using the abstract nonsense that gives you the singular value decomposition for an Hilbert Schmidt operator. And then you just have uh, a countable set and you index by the integers. But from the settings, for instance, that Yalmar was uh, dealing with, we, we know that uh, you, you have polynomials in the trigonometric case. Here you don't incidentally. Um, and there, it's much more natural to label the basis functions 
by multi-index. And here, because we have this, this center of mass restriction, uh, I would expect that this is the, the right way, so to speak, to label these eigenfunctions viewed from another more natural, more cogent perspective. Because again, this, this is not the right way of looking at it. I know that, but I, I have no better way at the, at the moment. Okay, so that's, that's that, that case. And the A3 case is, is quite similar. So again, that these two commute is, is just very easy to verify just the quasi-periodicity of the coefficients. Again, you need this weight function that Shlomo already has. And it gives you again, this simpler form where with a different C, we have this restricted configuration space. So we need uh, now this uh, similarity transformation and now the strictest Lebesgue measure on, on the hyper surface in, uh, in R4. And these are now the Hilbert Schmidt operators. And we need to insist that the imaginary part of this uh, arbitrary parameter D be smaller than um, A on two. A is the half sum of the scale parameters, right? So that you don't get singularities on the, on the real, uh, on the real uh, G3. But that's, that's the only thing you need. And again, then you have square integrability. So square integrability tells you these are hilbert schmidt integral operators. And from that point of view, we now expect that here we, we have a commutative family of hilbert schmidt operators. Remember the analytic difference operator is, is just one, there's, there's just one, but you have the whole family of field Schmidt operators and the analytic difference operator, you expect to have unique eigenvectors. So that's why you expect a commutative family of Hilbert Schmidt operators. You should have positive eigenvalues viewed as eigenfunctions for the Hamiltonians. And then again, you solve the key problem that you have in quantum mechanics. You have a formally given operators formally self-adjoint. Now, can you promote it to a genuine self-adjoint operator on Hilbert space? Because you're dealing with unbounded operators, you need to dense subspace. And that's, that's the, the key problem with unbounded operators. You, you're running into things like self-adjoint extensions, but that never occurs here in this setting because the eigenfunctions of the Hilbert Schmidt operators they fix the self-joint extension, you could, you could put it that way, because it, it makes it unique. These are the eigenfunctions that you expect. Now, um, what is the precise version of these expectations? And also uh, the kernel identity in the Hilbert space setting, because that would be immediate from, from this conjecture. It is that you have this expansion with again, the JN not being just a, a finite set or, or an infinite set with uh, a non-trivial author complement. No, you, you expect it to be an orthonormal base. So it's complete. That's what, what the expectation is. And the further uh, expectations are mimicking the ones that I already wrote down for the A2 case, extension to this, to this hyperplane. Yes, so, uh, so, sorry, Simon, you're extending your time. I, I, I don't know how to make this. I'm, this I'm gone. Look at the numbers. This is, this is my last slide. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, just so you. Uh, yeah. Can you see the numbers yeah. here? Yeah, I can. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, please finish. These, but, I mean, you, are, you don't have a lot These are exactly the same. Um, these are exactly the same conditions that we had before. This is just the, the finiteness of the Hilbert Schmidt condition, the Hilbert Schmidt uh, norm, right here. And this is again the more natural thing. So here are the references. That's all. And sorry for going one minute over time. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so thanks. Yeah, so and any questions? Uh...
I will. So I guess I mean I, I kind of gathered from your talk that these the, the things you talk about it's it's uh, special for low rank, right? You you don't expect this to be like a special case of general A and things or or do no, you? No, it's it's a very very special situation. There's, yeah. there's also the case in the super conformal uh, quantum field theory uh, setting. I mean that's that's how Shlomo uh, arrived at these uh, at these special cases. I seem to remember is also something. Uh, slightly more involved for one of the exceptional groups, but that's all. It, it comes from a classification of, uh, of superconformal field theories that uh, uh, is, I think, already in earlier work um, with co-authors. Maybe, I think Slomo is, is uh, in the audience, so maybe, maybe he can comment, but uh, Yes, it's, it's a very special situation and very intriguing, because again, it, it seems very surprising just from the point of view of uh, the closure motor toda setting. It, it, there's a similarity, and yet there isn't because of this extra constraint, and um, you would never guess this to to be true from from that yeah. setting. Yeah. Yeah, from QFT point of view, there is only A2, A3, A4, A6, A7, A8. And we don't know about, but we know we can derive these things only for the A2 and A3. And we don't know what, what is the structure for the other groups, but there might be. But in, in QFT, it's related to classification of anomaly free six dimensional uh, Lagrangians. And uh, it's very restricted problem. I remember, could I ask in one, uh, two questions? So in the Absolutely. A3 case, would you expect another higher order operator to exist as well? Uh, or do you just expect to have this lower, this first order operator? Well, yes, I, I, I do expect that to be uh, one more, but, uh, or rather two more, <laughs> but I, I, I don't know what they would look like. I mean, the, the obvious guess is that you would take X to minus X. That would be the analog of what Yalmar already discussed for the Kaloser Moser case, right? That you take X to mm. minus X basically. But if you do that, you get an operator that does not commute with the, the, the previous one. So it's, it's a quite different setting. And yes, it, it's, a, it's the right question to ask, uh, Barok. Uh, there, there, should be, there should be two more, but I, I, I don't know. But I would expect one of them to be the total shift operator, just the product of. Uh, uh, the total momentum op uh, exponential of the total momentum operator, right? No, uh, right? Because, because then you get then you get uh, out of the center of mass. Uh, let's see. I, I think in principle one can compute these operators from the QFT logic. I, I never did it, but uh, the way we obtain this operator is uh, by looking on residues of some integral. And it has more residues and the, it will generate more operators, like looking on more general residues. And we just didn't do that, but it is possible to try and compute them explicitly. Because yeah. I would expect, since this A type system is, should be translation invariant um, system, right? So you just have to restrict to some other hyperplane uh, if you do this. Yeah, but it, it makes it hard. If you have a conjectured form of these operators to show that it commutes with the given one, you see, this is so it, mm. it, because of the, the uh, fact that you need to restrict uh, the it won't stare you in the face that they commute, you have to do some work. But uh, mm. yeah, if, if you could do this residue calculation that uh, Shlomo is referring to, then you, you could. Uh, you could try and uh, show directly that they commute and that also the kernel identities hold for these additional two operators because in the A3 case you actually expect two 
two mm. more independent. Mm. So uh, my final question, and then so maybe you already answered it in some part, but that these operators are not at all uh, like the A type operators you constructed, this relativistic Calogero Moser operators. They are not. Well, not at all. I wouldn't say not at all, because they, they again are just these products of data functions, uh, depending on differences of uh, position. So they, they are vaguely similar. And actually, more is true. If you go, I didn't uh, have time uh, to go through the uh, degenerate levels, but you go to you go to the rational level, and then you can tie them in with the analytic difference operators of the dual of the TODA uh, system for the appropriate number of variables. So the A2 TODA uh, mm. dual TODA analytic difference operators and the A3 dual TODA relativistic uh, TODA uh, operators turn out to be nearly identical to what you get then. You need to do some work, but uh, mm. so there is there is a connection, but only at the lowest level, at the rational level. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so maybe we should go to the next speaker. So now, now I guess we're back to the other, the alternative schedule where we start 10 past. Uh, so Felipe, are you there and ready? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Uh, I'm here. I don't know whether I'm, I'm ready. I, uh, that we will see soon. Yeah, no. Uh, I am trying to share the screen. I have to go to... Well, is this okay? Yeah, it looks uh, great. Oh, wait a minute. I see that I didn't switch on my camera. Uh, maybe I can switch on my camera. Yeah, okay. Yeah, now I see you. Uh, okay, I'm now I'm ready, I think. Yeah, okay. So you, I mean, you see everything. The, the next speaker is Philippe van Dien, and he will talk about eigenfunctions of a discrete elliptic integrable particle model with hyperoctahedral symmetry. Okay. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Jalmar. Uh, a big thanks to the organizers uh, for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, it's a long time wish of mine to say something about eigenfunctions of uh, elliptic uh, particle systems, but I didn't really expect to be able to uh, to say anything useful, uh, um, the way things were developing in the, in the elliptic world, uh, it, it looked so complicated to me that uh, I, I felt, uh, well, here is nothing I can do. But like four years ago, uh, Thomas Gerber came to a conference in uh, Santiago on uh, nonlinear mathematical physics. And afterwards he visited me and then we decided, yeah, let's let's solve some elliptic uh, quantum uh, problem, right? Well, it's easy to say, of course, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, we couldn't solve so much. So uh, we looked for a quantum problem that we can uh, with elliptic potentials, which we can could actually solve, and well, it was kind of slow progress until like a year ago when all of a sudden we decided, let's look at the simplest case. Uh, we, we could have decided that a bit earlier, I guess. But, uh, and then when we looked at the simplest case, then all of a sudden we could solve something. And that's what I wanna talk to, uh, about today. Okay. Um, well, so it's elliptic. So I need some uh, elliptic, uh, functions. And I will use here in this talk, uh, basically Jacobi theta functions, but I will normalize them in a little bit uh, a different way from the standard way. So this here, theta one is uh, the elliptic uh, Jacobi one function normalized in a, in a suitable way. And the ZRs from, are from two to three to four are the, uh, the associated uh, uh, Jacobi uh, theta functions normalized. So the normalization that I use is in such a way that the trigonometric limit, that means here 
sending, uh, putting p equal to zero, uh, that you then get this quotient of sine functions. Uh, basically, this is, uh, uh, we have to think of this as a, as, a, as a Q number, the Q number of C. And in the rational li limit, you just get the number Z itself. And so ideolo uh, the ideology is that Z1 is like the elliptic uh, number of, of, of Z. So that's the normalization. Uh, at these square brackets, it's uh, completely standard. Uh, we saw it also in Jarma's talk and, and I've seen it everywhere, uh, but it doesn't always mean the same. Well, here it means this, the Jacobi theta function uh, normalized in, 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 in the way. Uh, so there are some parameters. There's an alpha going around. That's basically the real period. And there is a P uh, uh, that's the usual P or it's sometimes used Q, but I don't want to use it Q because uh, I will get confused with, with other Qs that are around in this business. So it's the P of the uh, Jacobi uh, theta function. So basically this is, uh, has to do with the imaginary period. Okay, so, so much about theta functions. And now uh, what about uh, the model? So, well, it's an old model uh, given by a second order difference uh, operator. It's uh, of Rauschner's type, but uh, instead of type A, it's type BC. So here is, I've written down the, the difference operator, TG, TJ, sorry, uh, just shifts by a, by a unit and the inverse of course shifts back. Uh, I've rescaled my variables in such a way that uh, I always have a unit shift uh, in my story. That's no, uh, that's no problem. And, and so here is the difference operator. If it, you just take the black part of the coefficient, that would be the, the Rauschner system. But then we, you, we do BC, BCN. So we have this blue extra parts. This is from the type D and this is from the external field, if you like. And uh, I've here four parameters. Yeah, uh, so people are not used to, uh, uh, people that, that see this talk now think, oh, what's this? This is a decent operator. I mean, this guy never writes down any decent operator. So what's wrong? Well, uh, yes, I simplified for the purpose of this talk a bit and I put four of the coupling parameters equal to zero, just to have a little bit. Uh, simpler expressions, but everything works with uh, with uh, the full line of uh, coupling parameters that you can have here uh, at, at this BC level. Uh, I, I just uh, switched off four of them. And so it means that the additive part in the difference operator becomes zero and uh, everything looks uh, quite nice. But in the paper, we do really the full story. Uh, I just thought for this talk, I will make my life a bit more simpler. And well, so this is the difference operator, very nice. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes. So I want to recall some features of this difference operator just before we uh, start looking at eigenfunctions. Uh, uh, this difference operator, it, it looked nice uh, and it is also nice. It, uh, well, Remember, I, I, I scaled uh, the different step size to unit step size, so I don't have step size parameter. But if I rescale back and then send the step size parameter to zero, and well, I should make a gauge transformation first. And well, then I get back uh, Inocentsev uh, 89 collateral model. So here's the Hamiltonian of that uh, collateral, uh, Inocentsev collateral model. It's like, the, I think, one of the most general. Uh, collateral models, uh, if you exclude, exclude different type of uh, and the super extension, different type of particles, and if you exclude spin, then this is the, the one of the most general ones. Uh, here in black again is the collateral with the uh, Y stress P, and here is the BC with uh, the four parameters. So that you get as, uh, as the, the differential limit of this difference operator that I wrote down. Actually, you can get this from the four parameter uh, reduction that I, uh, that I wrote down. Uh, and you can get the full inoffensive already. Okay, so that's, that's one special case. If you put uh, P equal to zero, so the trigonometric limit, then uh, uh, if you look back, this, uh, these things become basically signs or 
if you like, uh, Q numbers. So then this is basically uh, a corn winner McDonald type operator. Actually, since I uh, switched off four of my coupling parameters, this is actually just a BC and McDonald operator. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, this is the operator that corresponds to the admissible pair BCN comma BN, but that's that's a detail, right? So it's just a McDonald operator uh, in this uh, in this reduction that I use in the talk. But in more in general, you would get uh, the the corn winner operator in the trigonometric limit. Well, very nice. Uh, uh, at the time, I tried to prove that this was quantum integrable, but I. I got only partial results, but a few years later, Komori and Ikami with a very nice uh, uh, R matrix uh, formalism uh, proved that this uh, difference operator is uh, actually integral. So uh, that's nice. And uh, well, uh, Rauschenaar, uh, he, he noticed that there are uh, uh, remarkable reflection symmetries in the parameters. So my way of writing uh, these operators uh, has suppresses some of these symmetries because if you see here, I, I kind of have, uh, have shifts over the half periods. If I absorb in the numerator the shifts of the half, per, uh, half periods in the parameter, then I can make it completely symmetric in these parameters. Uh, and that's what people usually do, uh, uh, but I won't for the purpose of this tool. And so then it becomes uh, completely uh, symmetric in these in these parameters, and then uh, actually there are much more symmetries. Uh, and well, if you don't reduce to only eight, uh, sorry, only four of such parameters, but keep the full eight parameters, then uh, uh, Rajna sh showed that you have uh, E eight uh, uh, while group symmetry in the in the parameters. So not just permutations, but a lot a lot more. Anyway, I won't talk about this. And I here I, I should stress that I've broken the symmetry by uh, shifting over these uh, half periods. You see it also in the Inu Jemsev model. Uh, here the symmetry is broken. It's not it's not invariant under the parameters because there are these shifts over the half periods. And I and I I, I will keep like the difference counterpart of this picture. So yeah. Uh, I will mostly ignore the symmetries or completely ignore the symmetries. So, okay. What else? Uh, well, this operator uh, uh, arose late, later on in, in, in various uh, elliptic stories. So, uh, for instance, in Rain's uh, papers on elliptic hypergeometric integrals and by orthogonal functions associated with the root system BCN, uh, exactly this reduction of the of the, the second the second order difference operator. So the four parameter one is plays an important role. And it's also connected to the elliptic uh, da half range that he recently studied. Anyway, so even though I don't understand uh, uh, everything in those papers or I say uh, many things in those papers, uh, I do recognize that uh, uh, I see some difference operators that, uh, that, that, that are, uh, that I'm used to and that I'm quite friendly. Okay, well, a recent uh, uh, paper of uh, Oleg Shalik, he, he proved actually that you can uh, construct the, quant the integrals of this uh, difference operator. And, and I think in the full uh, nine parameter, coupling parameter case, that you can uh, construct them uh, out of a quantum Lex matrix. And that's, uh, of course, very interesting also in the classical limit, because it means that uh, you and you have a way of constructing a Lex matrix uh, for, the, for the classical system. And uh, it's one of the big open problems for many years. Uh, so uh, the, the, that's really nice. Uh, other recent developments is that, well, uh, the eigenfunctions. Uh, we, 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 in, in Simon's talk, uh, eigenfunctions were fundamental. They're always fundamental in quantum integrability. What about these ones? Well. Uh, some uh, special uh, explicit eigenfunctions for these uh, different operators uh, are known. Here are some of the people, Farrow, Katai, Naomi, Reisner himself solved uh, the one particle case. And I think one of the earlier 
traces of, uh, of, of, of special eigenfunctions for this operator I, I found in the work of Spiridonov. I refer to this one, but uh, there are others too. Uh, okay, so there is some information about the eigenfunction, but there's not, uh, I think, uh, except in the one particle case, uh, any candidate of, of, of a full basis of, uh, uh, in the Hilbert space sense of uh, solving uh, uh, completely the spectral problem in, in Hilbert space. I think that's, uh, that's still not known. Um, other nice things is that for n equal to one, this difference operator, which is like a kind of a difference uh, Hoyne operator, uh, it, it arises as a re reduction of uh, the Lex operator for Sakai's elliptic uh, Penleve equation. Uh, this is, has to do with the famous Calogero uh, uh, Penleve correspondence, which relates the Penleve uh, to Calogero type systems. So, in kind of uh, in, in kind of, in, the, in the classical case, it would be the Penleve six would correspond to from that point of view to the Inosemtsev uh, one particle system. So with the four p functions. So there is a kind of generalization of this uh, this correspondence uh, in a very precise sense in this paper by Naomi Rauschnitz and Yamada. And so for n is equal to one, uh, you get uh, the eight parameter, eight coupling parameter uh, uh, difference operator as a reduction of the, of the leg separating for the elliptic uh, Penlevé equation. Well, and then finally, uh, H, this difference operator is related to uh, complexifications of conformal meta theories on a punctured Riemann surface. Now, unfortunately, I'm probably the only one in this audience who, who doesn't really understand what, I, what, what I'm reading here. So I apologize for that and I won't go into detail. I hope you will. But it's uh, of course quite uh, fascinating that uh, this operator does not, uh, it's not like an isolated thing. It, uh, it appears in, uh, in many, it starts to appear in many other contexts too. So, well, that's uh, a small overview of where the, this operator uh, appears and what, what, what is known about it. And now let me go to my story. Uh, so I wanted to, uh, to construct eigenfunctions of this operator, but uh, well, uh, not so simple. So uh, as a good mathematician with Thomas, uh, we, we try to reformulate this problem until we finally had formulated in something that we could answer. And uh, the key was uh, we had to look at the compact versions of these, uh, of these models. And that means that we are going to discretize, we are going to restrict uh, to a lattice. And in this case, the appropriate lattice is uh, basically and the lattice of uh, partitions shifted about over a deformed wild vector. And that's quite common. Uh, so we're going to discretize on this lattice of partitions shifted by the parameter deformed row vector for the BCN road system. Uh, so of course these 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 these, uh, these partitions are just encode uh, the dominant weights of the Lie algebra. Uh, and so in some sense, we restrict to the cone of dominant weights. Yeah, shift it a little bit. Well, we're still uh, dealing with infinite dimensional uh, space. So it's still uh, a bit hard. So we decided to, to simplify even more and uh, truncate. So that's the next, next step. So instead of uh, considering the, the fundamental uh, Weights for the for the for the Lie for the Lie algebra. Well, we 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 looked at the affine Lie algebra, uh, and we truncated at level m. So, what does it mean concretely? We pick the parameter the, the period parameter and relate it to the coupling constant in the following way. Uh, from now on, my coupling parameters will be positive. And this condition here that uh, the period should be related to the coupling parameters in this way is like provides like a, a Rekha type reduction. Uh, it's the elliptic counterpart of, uh, of a Rekha type reduction. And the operator, which first uh, restricted to the shifted cone of, uh, of uh, partitions, now truncates on, on uh, a finite 
lattice of shifted bounded partitions. Here's the lattice and it truncates at uh, beyond level M. So uh, the whole point is that the operator, uh, if you restrict to functions supported on, these, uh, on this lattice, uh, 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 restricts to this space. And the coefficients are in such a way that uh, this space is preserved. So that's nice because uh, now uh, we have turned uh, the infinite dimensional eigenvalue pr problem into a finite dimensional one. And it is like, like this has a finite number of points. So all of a sudden, uh, there is a chance that we can actually do something, even if, we, even if we don't know much about elliptic stuff. Okay. We have to turn our, uh, our uh, function space of uh, lattice functions into a, into a Hilbert space. Now I'm gonna translate uh, uh, over this, uh, over this uh, deformed wild vector. And I'm just considering the lattice over the partitions itself. So I've just translated the origin, right? So uh, I will just look at this Hilbert space of functions on the, on the, on, on, on this finite uh, lattice of bounded partitions, uh, which truncate be beyond the level M, and it's N plus M over N dimensional space of functions. And we will turn it into a Hilbert space with the following inner product. And this looks very, very, uh, very familiar uh, to people in, uh, in an elliptic hypergeometry. Uh, and in Q hypergeometry and hypergeometry. It's 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 the only thing uh, thing is that here I have these uh, uh, these, uh, these theta functions, of course, these no normalized theta functions. Even the normalization here doesn't doesn't play a role. I have the usual convention. If you see this red plus minus, it means that uh, uh, you should take the vector with the the vector with a plus and the vector with a minus. So it's it's the product of those two, right? It's uh, just a uh, shorthand in order to have my uh, expressions uh, of manageable size so that I can put them on the slide. So here is, uh, for instance, this one uh, is this factor with here a plus and here a plus multiplied by this factor with a minus and that's everywhere. And here I have uh, like elliptic uh, factorials which are just like in Yalmar's uh, talk, they're just product of uh, of uh, these uh, theta functions. Okay, so this is the orthogonality measure. And now if you uh, have these positive parameters and you also have this truncation condition, then the good news is that this is just a positive uh, uh, measure. It's really positive. And the, the key is that you're always evaluating uh, the Jacobi uh, theta functions uh, within uh, within the, the positive uh, half period, so to say. And so, uh, in fact, actually everything is positive. So the product is also positive. So uh, we have a finite dimensional function space. We have uh, even uh, turned, it, turned it in, uh, into a Hilbert space. And we have operators uh, uh, that are stable in the space that map the space into itself. And the best news is the operators are self-adjoint with respect to this uh, inner product structure. So here I've uh, written down the explicit action of the operator in this uh, Hilbert space. These are just uh, the coefficients of the, of the difference operator, but discretized on the, in the appropriate points. And here I've not shifted over row because I've translated in my functions uh, uh, back to the origin. So this is the action of the uh, the BCN operator in this uh, Hilbert space, here are the coefficients. So in the coefficients, you see that the actual discretization was actually shifted by a row. Okay, the operator self adjoint that's just a simple uh, calculation. And so that's good news. Now we have, uh, uh, we have uh, almost for free, uh, an elliptic eigenvalue problem uh, in, in a Hilbert space really, and it's self-adjoint and it's even finite dimensional. Yeah, it's a bit too simple, uh, but uh, at least 
now people like me can do something with it. So what about di diagonalization? So since it's a self-adjoint operator in a finite dimensional uh, uh, Hilbert space, and of course you have uh, orthogonal eigenbasins, that, that, that's clear. And uh, so it means you have uh, also real eigenvalues, that's also clear. Now, what's not clear is that these uh, eigenvalues are really simple, but that you can uh, deduce from a trigonometric limit, because if you put P equal to zero, this operator is just like a BC McDonald operator, and you know actually the eigenvalues, you can compute them explicitly, or they have been computed. And here they are. And then you see that for generic uh, parameters, uh, as a function of these parameters, uh, these eigenvalues are actually simple. And that means that since everything is analytic in P, that the eigenvalues in, for general P as analytic functions of P uh, must be uh, distinct. So uh, the eigenvalues are simple in this sense. The, 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 the eigenvalues, which are analytic functions of the deformation parameter P are different, uh, are, are distinct as analytic functions of P for generic coupling parameters. So that's nice. Uh, uh, from the p equal to zero limit, we can we can can see that. Well, to say more about the eigenvalues seems seems kind of non-trivial, so uh, we'll leave it uh, at that and uh, concentrate from now on on the on the eigenfunctions. Well, uh, again, the spectral theorem tells you that there is an. Uh, uh, orthogonal basis of eigenfunction orthonormal and that it's analytic in P and everything. Um, but can we construct a bit more explicit, uh, explicitly this uh, eigenbasis? That's, that's, that's a problem. Well, I just mentioned that the eigenfunctions, uh, the eigenvalue story are simple as functions of P. Uh, and so I now assume that my coupling parameters are generic such that this discriminant, or it's actually the square of the discriminant, is not equal to zero, right? Then uh, I can actually just use a linear algebra, uh, construct the eigenfunctions with the Cayley Hamilton theorem by acting on a cyclic vector. Here's the formula. And it's clear that uh, this thing solves the eigenvalue uh, equation with eigenvalue, the one that I skipped, E nu. It's not clear that this thing is not equal to zero, but if chi is a cyclic vector, uh, it, that will be the case. Well, for chi, we take this very simple uh, uh, indicator function uh, uh, supported in the origin only. And I'm saying, well, this is, this is enough. So if I use this, uh, this I can use as a cyclic vector vector to, to, to uh, construct, uh, construct eigenbasis. Of course, constructing is a big word. I mean, uh, this is a very cumbersome formula, but it's, uh, it, it, it's useful uh, for theoretical purposes. So here comes the, uh, the summary. So our difference operator, uh, which is self-adjoint in this Hilbert, finite dimensional Hilbert space has an orthogonal basis of eigenfunctions. Uh, that depend analytically on the parameter. I can actually label these uh, eigenfunctions by, by the, the lattice points. And that is because at P equal to zero, the eigenvalues from the trigonometric lipid are naturally labeled by this, uh, by, by this same lattice. And since the eigenvalues are uh, distinct, this labeling uh, for, for generating like P, generic P, this labeling uh, extends to the elliptic case. So uh, I have an orthonormal basis of eigenfunction satisfying this, uh, this eigenvalue uh, equation and, uh, uh, and uh, everything as analytic in P. So that's basically uh, uh, just the spectral theorem and of uh, self-adjoint uh, operators in finite dimension uh, 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 using also Cato uh, who says that everything is uh, analytic. Now, I want to compare this, ba this basis with the basis we constructed in terms of these, uh, uh, the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. Uh, and here's the relation. It's just uh, the same basis, of course, because the spectrum is, uh, is, uh, is simple, uh, up to normalization. And here is the precise uh, relation. So 
the, the autonomous, autonomous basis from the spectral theorem is related to this H basis by this renormalization. And we see that we get an auto, that the, this H uh, basis is an orthogonal eigenbasis with the norm equal to the value of the function in the original. So if, if, the, if the value of this function in the origin is not equal to zero, then you really have a basis. So that I just have to check that that's the case. Uh, and that's equivalent to saying that this function chi is a cyclic, uh, cyclic uh, vector. And that you can again check from the, the p equal zero limit, because then at p equal zero, you can compute this explicitly and you see that the value in zero for generic uh, coupling parameters at least is not equal to zero. Uh, actually at, at p equals zero, it's, it's never equal to zero. So that means that uh, by analyticity, this extends to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to non-trivial p uh, also. So here is the, the precise trigonometric limit at p equal to zero, then the difference operator becomes a, a McDonald operator. And you can really compute these uh, uh, eigenfunctions in terms of uh, McDonald corn winner polynomials. Uh, you would expect just McDonald polynomials, but there is the kind of duality involved here. And it's easier to express them just in terms of uh, McDonald corn winner polynomials. Also, uh, this is actually, I re remember, this is actually a reduction of the full story with all the parameters. And then you definitely have McDonald corn winner polynomials if you uh, take the trigonometric uh, reduction. So here is the explicit uh, expression of these, uh, of these eigenbases in terms of uh, McDonald corn winner polynomials. Here are the parameters. You see, uh, this, this is a reduction. And this reduction is dual to the, uh, in some sense, to the BC uh, McDonald uh, uh, polynomials. You can then also compute explicitly the normalization uh, that we've used and everything in terms of Q numbers in, 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 instead of these elliptic numbers. So, uh, to, 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 to summarize, uh, we have constructed uh, an orthogonal eigenbasis of the elliptic problem. And uh, in order to, uh, to see that everything is okay, we use uh, the P equal to zero limit and uh, perturbation arguments. And uh, that shows that really this uh, provides uh, uh, a good basis uh, and that our factor, factor chi was really a cyclic vector. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's, that's kind of the general story, but uh, it's still a bit uh, unsatisfactory because uh, um, yeah, one would like to say more about these eigenfunctions. For instance, uh, in the trigonometric case, you see that there are actually polynomials, but in, in general, uh, there's no mention of polynomials at all because uh, uh, I cannot really prove in general that these uh, eigenfunctions uh, H are are really polynomials. Uh, for that, you would need uh, more information on the commuting uh, difference operators. And uh, even though these difference operators uh, are shown to exist, you would have to restrict them to, to the finite dimensional lattice and uh, uh, all, all kinds of things that are, 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 are not so easy at this point. So uh, let's look at some special cases where we can say a little bit more, right? So. Very interesting case is, of course, the one particle case. So then this truncated uh, difference eigenvalue problem, uh, it's it just a level M truncated difference Hoyne equation in that case. It's of this form here. It's very simple. Here are the coefficients. And uh, so now uh, this eigenvalue, is, uh, eigenvalue problem is of tri-diagonal tri form and finite dimensional. So, I mean, you can apply all the tricks in the classical books and to solve this, here are the orthogonality weights, again, in terms of these uh, elliptic factorials. And uh, since this is tridiagonal, we can write down the, the eigenvectors now in terms of polynomials uh, uh, as follows. Uh, we form these uh, uh, determinants, where he, here we just have the coefficients of the, diff of, of, of the three, of the three term recurrence and the co coefficients of the difference operator. 
And yeah, this gives rise to elliptic Rayka polynomials because if you put P, P equal to zero, these are just the Q Rayka polynomials, right? Uh, so it's a kind of generalization of that. Uh, so after having these polynomials, we can express the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian in one particle Hamiltonian in terms of the zeros of the n plus one polynomial because it truncates. So uh, the eigenvalues are equal to the zeros of the n plus one polynomial. That's tri trivial because uh, you, I mean, the n plus one uh, matrix is just uh, the eigenvalue, the matrix representing the eigenvalue problem. So that's that's kind of trivial. But anyway, we have more information than before in general because now we have like an, uh, an, an algebraic general uh, uh, characterization of the eigenvalues that you don't have in general. Uh, in, in, in general, you have just eigenvalues in terms of the spectral theorem. But here we can see, yeah, it's these eigenvalues uh, are the zeros if this n plus one degree elliptic Raga polynomial. Okay, that, that's one thing. And they're ordered like this. This corresponds to the, the ordering that I used in the main theorem. So and the, the weights in the rank one situation are just integers from zero to n and the, the level up to level m. And the, the eigenvalues are, are simple in this case because uh, these coefficients here are positive on the off diagonal, well, with the minus they're negative, but anyway, if uh, the product is positive, means that the eigenvalue values of this matrix are, are simple. So we have really simple roots for, for the whole parameter domain uh, in this situation. So, and the ordering of those roots corresponds to uh, the labeling uh, in, the, in the theorem. Okay, that's nice. Uh, what about the eigenfunctions? Well, the eigenfunctions we can now compute explicitly in terms of the elliptic Raka polynomials. Here they are. It's a formula very similar to the trigonometric case in general. So now this is the elliptic Raka polynomial evaluated on the spectrum. And we have some normalization constants, which, which we can now actually compute using uh, the Christoffel Darbo formula completely explicitly in terms of the eigenvalues. So that's nice. We, uh, you can get a bit further. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, the eigenvalues, and it, they are still, I, I don't have an explicit uh, formula for that, but uh, everything is explicit in terms of the spectrum. Okay, so that's the one particle case. What can we do more? Well, if you can do the one particle case, you can also do the G equal one case. So that's the, uh, the case of uh, free fermions where the interaction, uh, between the particles uh, almost becomes free. You just have a, like, a, like a free fermion uh, repulsion left. And so you can write the end particle solution in terms of Slater determin determinants uh, of, of one particle functions. Uh, you have to make a little gauge transformation to see that really things become free. So if you take the end particle Hamiltonian, put the coupling parameter equal to one, uh, the one that, uh, manages the interaction between the particles and makes this gauge transformation, you get this free operator, uh, which models uh, free fermions uh, on a lattice of size n plus n minus one. Well, that you can of course solve and then translate back and you get the following uh, result for the eigenfunctions. Uh, eigen so if g equal to one, uh, our truncation condition becomes of this type in that case, and the E zero up to E n plus n minus one are the roots of the elliptic Rayka polynomial degree n plus m. That is what you need here. And then you can express everything in terms of these roots. So the eigenvalues of the n particle Hamiltonian become just sums of these roots and the eigenfunctions become uh, Slater determinants or if you like, sure polynomials in the sense of McDonald, the ninth variation of sure polynomials that are associated to the elliptic Raka polynomials. So it's basically a, a Slater de determinant of uh, elliptic Raka polynomials evaluated on the spectrum, uh, divided by a kind of a wild denominator. Uh, and so here you again have an explicit formula 
for these eigenfunctions in that case, explicit in terms of the eigenvalue uh, of, of these roots of the polynomial, the Rekha polynomial, elliptic Rekha polynomial of degree n plus n. So apart from uh, this, you have to compute once and then everything else is explicit. But uh, yeah, it, it's only uh, for the case with uh, g equal one and some, some sense that, uh, that, that the interaction is very simple, of course, it's just free, free fermions. And we can also compute in this case, the normalization explicitly in terms of the, of the one particle normalizations that we've computed uh, here. Uh, so, so here are the one particle normalizations for the elliptic Raka. And so that you would have to insert here. These deltas are one particle orthogonality measures and these Cs are one particle uh, C functions. Anyway, so this becomes uh, completely explicit uh, at the deter determinantal point of the coupling uh, parameter. Well, uh, I don't know how, how I'm about time. I'm quite well, actually. Uh, the last uh, thing, uh, so, so, so quite noticeable is that in all these cases, we have uh, constructed uh, the eigenfunctions in terms of polynomials on the spectrum, right? So in the, in the elliptic Rekha case, and it's the one particle case in the free fermion case. And there is one more case in which you can easily uh, compute everything uh, in terms of polynomials on the spectrum. And that's the level m equal to one case. So now uh, this lattice of partitions consists only of one column partitions. So uh, the, the empty partition up to the partition with full of ones, right? So I use this now as standard notation. So my lattice consists of only such partitions uh, at level m equal to one. And this means that uh, the eigenvalue problem becomes again tridiagonal in this situation. Just the coefficients are a little bit different from the, from the elliptic Raka case. So m equal to one again gives a tridiagonal problem. And so we can, again, using a standard theory of a triangular uh, 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 matrices, uh, solve this eigenvalue problem also in this case. So this, uh, the, 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 the nice thing is here, I have a non-trivial uh, interaction between the particles. G is not equal to one. G is general, the coupling parameter. I've just restricted the level uh, to the extreme case, which is not trivial. So, and you uh, construct the determinants to get the eigen, uh, uh, the characteristic polynomial and the eigen uh, vectors, and you get the following result. So in this case, the eigenvalues are again simple. This, this is the ordering corresponding to the numbering in the main theorem. And these are the simple roots of the polynomial P corresponding to the partition n plus one. So n plus one ones. So it's this determinant, but for k equal to n plus one, right? So that's, that's just uh, there's the polynomial. It has uh, simple zeros because the off diagonals are uh, product of off diagonals are positive. And so that means that the spectrum is really, again, simple for the whole parameter space, not just generically. And we can again express the eigenfunctions functions expressly, explicitly in terms of polynomials on the spectrum and compute the normalization again in the same way with uh, Christophe von Darbou. And here the C functions and the, and the orthogonality measure can be conveniently expressed in terms of the coefficients of the, of the, of the recurrence relation in, in, in this way. So, that's basically my story. Uh, there's a general, uh, uh, in, in general, we can uh, uh, construct these, uh, these, these, these eigenfunctions of this model. Uh, it's elliptic, so that's nice. So it's finite dimensional, so that's why I can do it. And uh, in these three special cases, uh, uh, we can uh, actually construct the eigenfunctions in terms of polynomials on the spectrum. Um, if we would have, the higher commuting uh, operators, uh, if we would know a little bit more about them, we can uh, uh, we could prove that in general we uh, there should be a multivariable uh, 
polynomials such that the eigen functions are equal to restrictions of these uh, multivariable polynomials uh, on the spectrum. In the elliptic uh, Rauschner's case, uh, so type A, we can we, we can really do that because there we have the, we have all these operators. But here, uh, these operators are a bit more difficult, uh, and so some work has to be done. And uh, uh, with Thomas, we didn't do that. I don't know whether we are going to do it. Uh, that remains an open question. To close. Here are some references. This talk is based on the two first references. Uh, one, the rank one cases in this paper on elliptic Reka polynomials, which is on the archive, and the other paper is also on the archive, but should appear. And here are some uh, uh, related literature, uh, not about the discrete model, but more in general. Uh, there are these papers by Farouk Atai. Uh, where some special eigenfunctions uh, are, are constructed in general and much more other things. Shalik's paper I mentioned about the leg, quantum leg spare, uh, Inu Semsev paper, Komori Hikami uh, concerning quantum integrability. Well, basically these are all papers I mentioned in the text somewhere. Uh, so that's, that's it. That's all I can tell you. Okay, thank you. So any questions or comments for Felipe? Did you look at all at the uh, kernel functions in this uh, finite dimensional context? No, no, I didn't look at all. I mean, uh, I basically tell you what I know. And so, uh, if there were no kernel functions <laughs> in the talk, there, it means that uh, I didn't look at that. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, uh, I mean, I don't even have polynomials here, right? I mean, for me, kernel functions are like uh, like uh, Cauchy kernels for uh, for polynomials, maybe. And uh, and uh, and here, uh, I, I don't even have polynomials yet, so. But uh, it's true. Maybe, uh, maybe I should think the other way around and try to find kernel functions and then uh, get to polynomials that way. So, but, but, but we haven't done that. But it's just, I, I think it's just a matter of discretizing in the kernel functions, just like you did for the difference operators. There you get yeah, matrices. Maybe. Then yeah, you get matrices. Yeah. It would be quite interesting to see what sort of eigenvalues they have on your explicit eigenfunctions. Yeah, that's true. So maybe you gave me the next idea. I don't know. I, I, I didn't think about it. It could that's draw light on, uh, on the whole situation because uh, after all, it should be possible to take a limit, take the discretization away, you know, and get the continuous case. So if you can get uh, a handle on that, yeah, that's true. Uh, usually, if you take such limits, you 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 lose, of course, uh, a lot of stuff, right? I mean, uh, yeah. But uh, so so, but but sure. Uh, that that's something. Uh, that's something. Uh, uh, that, that that's some, somehow in the back of my mind, of course. But it hasn't been worked out yet. I think in the uh, in the BCN case with n bigger than one, you need this uh, this balancing condition though, and that seems to play no role in your setting. Yeah, that's that's that, that's a, uh, that's a thing that I'm uh, always uh, uh, if if I'm I'm completely away from ellipt elliptic hypergeometry here, right? Where you always have these balancing conditions, and uh, somehow. Uh, I do have a truncation condition, of course, because I, I, I chose my period very special, but uh, I have no other balancing conditions. Uh, so I'm kind of away from elliptic uh, hypergeometry. And uh, so, uh, so yeah, for instance, these elliptic Rekha polynomials, I, I also don't have an elliptic hypergeometric representation of these things. I mean, I don't whether, know whether that that exists, even though in a trigonometric limit, you know, you can do it. But if you just 
take such a representation and, and naively substitute everything, it doesn't, it doesn't solve the right equation. Uh, so, I mean, uh, one of the psychological problems that I actually had with, it, with all this stuff is, uh, is to, to first forget the little I knew about elliptic hypergeometric hyper stuff before trying to solve something, right? So uh, it's right. Uh, there are no balancing conditions, fortunately for me, because uh, yeah. uh, All right, thanks. Anyone else? Uh, Jan Philippe, if I could ask a uh, small question. Um, in this, this this truncation that you do, do you still have uh, E8 symmetry or, or D8 symmetry? If, uh... Well, uh, as I told you, uh, or I told everybody, in fact, and, uh, in some sense, uh, the, the symmetry here is a bit broken, right? Because uh, because of the shifts over the half periods. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if you look at the uh, innocence of Hamiltonian, you kind of lost you kind of, kind of have lost. Uh, so of course here somehow it, it's still there, right? But you should, uh, it's no longer, for instance, permutation. You should, you should make uh, some uh, uh, sort of correct for the, for, for the shifts you made in over the half periods. So, uh, and then uh, you also should stick within the, within the parameter domain. Uh, I, I do have positivity conditions. So, uh, it's a good question, but uh, I, I didn't really uh, check that uh, any of the of the uh, what kind of transformations uh, uh, would uh, would uh, leave my parameter domain kind of invariant, right? So I, I, mm. the short answer is I, I don't really know, but uh, I've not. I'm, uh, I feel <laughs> that since from the from the start I broke the symmetries. In my reality domain, I can, and it's not so much to expect that uh, that I have these symmetries here, but uh, uh, I, I didn't really check. That, that's the honest answer. Mm. Thank you. I, I was just more wondering about the the sh uh, period that you put with this particular value. So it has depending on g one and g two. That's the tricky part. I thought to to get back the symmetry. Um, ah, yeah, exactly. So that, 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 that's probably uh, probably also very non-trivial. So I mean, uh, uh, for instance, you could you could ob obviously permute between between G one and G two, but you <laughs> and then if you permute with, I mean, this is kind of known uh, for uh, Q for Rika polynomials. There, there, you know how you, how you can. How, we, how, how to deal with these kind of symmetries and, and these permutation symmetries are, 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 are kind of, uh, they're, they're kind of preserved. So uh, you have different ways of expressing these, uh, these Rekha polynomials. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, I, I, in this case, I, I completely ignored it. Uh, uh, so that was maybe not so smart, but uh, it made my life uh, Kind of easy at the at the time. Maybe I I should reconsider this. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? It's it's hard to know when you don't. I mean. You, you just see these empty uh, boxes <laughs> symbolizing the participants. Yes, yes. But if there's no yeah. sound, there's no question, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, I guess now, now we have a five hour break at the meeting. So I guess so, some of us are going to bed and some are going to do some work or whatever. Uh, but then <clears throat> I, I think uh, I, I got a message from Peter Kurutev that he's on his way now at least. So, uh, I think he will be there then, and he will tell you if we if we're supposed to start at the hour or ten past because there's some there's some confusion about it. But I I recommend being there at the hour in five hours. Um,
and then you get some instructions. Will you be there, Yamar? Uh, no, it, that's like two o'clock in the morning for me. So I, <laughs> but all, all the talks will be on YouTube eventually. So I yeah. would uh, for sure watch it at some point. Yeah, okay, so thank you. Uh, see you tomorrow. Okay, bye. Bye.